Welcome to Submission Radio. It's June 21st. I'm Dennis Shkuratov here with Kasper Rozalowski. Two very different types of MMA events this on this weekend, Cass. It's been an awesome weekend. An MMA fan's wet dream. You had UFC Berlin and you had Bellator 138. It was it was just awesome, man, to come sit down and, and watch both events. There's a lot to talk about. We're going to be breaking down both cards. And, of course, we're going to be having three guests on the show. We have Stipe Mircic, a very quick chat with him. Because we, we've interviewed Stipe a lot recently in the last few months with UFC Adelaide and things like that. So we're just going to have a really quick catch-up with Stipe. He's obviously live in Berlin. Um, so apologies. I don't know how the sound is going to be. Sometimes when you call these international countries like Brazil and Berlin, it's not a Skype interview. So sometimes the, the audio quality maybe a little bit up and down, so apologies in advance, but we just want to get his thoughts on the heavyweight division and all things like that. Uh, speaking of heavyweights, we've got Ben Rothwell on the show, uh, the man obviously coming over a big victory over Matt Mitrione and one of the craziest entrances in MMA, so he's going to be on the show. And Al Quinta, Gilbert Melendez is in to fight Al Quinta UFC Fight Night 71 in San Diego, so we thought we'd have him on, uh, on the show to chat. So suffice it to say, it's a nicely packed show this week. Oh, absolutely. And guys, if you haven't had a chance, follow us on Twitter at Submission AUS, always putting up a bunch of interesting tweets, our thoughts, our opinions, and some content on there. If you don't follow us, please follow us. We'd love to hear from you. And also, youtube.com forward slash Submission Radio AU. We've got a whole bunch of excellent Submission Radio Technique of the Weeks. Um, mm. A lot of people think that these techniques are for the black belts, but they're for everyone. A lot of white belts can learn from them, and a lot of uh, experienced black belts can learn from them as well, because we've got a bunch of different experts in a bunch of different fields from a bunch of different gyms. So you don't, just don't have the same people doing it. You have people with different knowledge doing these techniques. And I know you guys are saying you want to see striking techniques. Don't worry, we hear you. And we'll be trying to get some put, put together in, in, you know, in the future. Oh, yeah. I think with the, with these techniques, just a quick sort of side note, we've only been doing, well, we haven't been doing, but we've been doing the technique for like the last, I don't know, six months, maybe a little bit more. So there's a whole bunch of them. If you go back through the archives, there's stuff from Sambo, there's stuff from MMA. Uh, the more MMA ones, they feature some striking. But, you know, the technique of the week, if, they're, if we're going to be doing a new one every single week for years and years and years to come. I mean, you know, we're just getting started. So believe me, there will be striking techniques. There'll be heaps of stuff, but definitely check that out. Um, if you are listening on YouTube, definitely subscribe, guys. Uh, don't forget to like the video. And if you are on Stitcher, iTunes or iTunes or anything like that, don't forget to give us a rating uh, or a review. We always appreciate those. Don't forget to comment below. Um, but other than that, it's it's a big show. And I think we've got our first guest on the line, uh, Dennis. Why don't you let the people, good people know who we've got? All right, guys. It's an absolute pleasure to introduce our next guest. He's become almost regular guest in our program. It's a pleasure for us to get to know him over the last few months here in Australia. And we've had him on the show a bunch of times. It's a pleasure to welcome Stipe Miocic back to Submission Radio, almost his second home here in Australia. Stipe, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me, brother. It's our pleasure. It's always great to have you on. You're obviously live from Berlin at the moment. Stipe, let's talk about some serious business. All right, before we get to the fights, your beloved Cleveland Cavaliers lost the NBA playoffs to the Golden State Warriors in six games. What happened, man? Uh, we lost, man. You know, it just wasn't our time. You know, they played hard, but you know, sometimes just you fall short once in a while. But, I mean, they, they get all they got. We're pro- real proud of them. Yeah, no, absolutely. You were actually at the game, I believe, the last game there. Just wondering, did you get a chance to speak with any of the guys? What was the vibe like? Because obviously, it was a bittersweet moment for you guys. Yeah, no, I didn't talk to anyone. I just went to the game, watched it, and went home. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty standard stuff. Seeing as you're in Berlin, we got to ask, you know, how's Berlin? How's Berlin treating you? So far, so good, man. People are great here, you know, good food, can't complain. <laughs> Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, we imagine being in Europe, it must be a big, big, almost um, very, very tempting for you to want to go over and visit Croatia. Are there any plans going up there while you're in Europe? Uh, no, no. I was going to be in Berlin for a couple of days and got to go home and go back to real life. <laughs> That's unfortunate. Well, I mean, seeing as you're in Germany, the recently the UFC has recently done Poland, Sweden, and now Germany. It seems like they're kind of teasing you. Do you wish they'd hurry up and go do a show in Croatia already? I hope, man. They said they said something about it, um, you know. But you know, we'll see what they say. You know, we, we have a lot of shows. And, you know, if they can get it, they can. If not, you know, it, it is what it is. But you know, hopefully they can. Yeah, well, hopefully so. Now let's talk business, Stipe. Your division, the heavyweight division, has gone quite a shakeup recently with Fabricio Vadum beating Cain Velasquez to become the new champion. First things first. What did you think of the fight? Oh, it was a great fight. They both came out swinging. I mean, they they wanted it, you know, and. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, for this show, he's the one that got it, you know. They're both competitors. They're great champions. And, you know, it was for each of those times that night. 
Were you like us? Were you shocked at the way Kane looked? He ran out of cardio and he got outclassed by Verdun. Uh, you know, no, I mean, you know, maybe it had to be at the altitude or, you know, and, you know, being you know, the case for a little bit, you know, and for a couple, you know, a couple of years. So, uh, you know, I mean, he'll be back strong. He's ever been, you know, he's a tough, he's a tough man. You know, he's a champ. He's a former champ. You know, the guy knows how to, how to fight. He'll be back stronger. No, absolutely. Now, you said before that you have what it takes to be Can Velasquez. After what Fabricio did to him, does that fill you with even more confidence that you also could have possibly been the former champ? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> I would kind of walk in a cage. I have a great game plan, no matter who it is. Uh, you know, I'm more confident when I walk in because I have great coaches. And uh, no matter what, what, what the guy, you know, brings to the table, I'll have a game plan for it. I think, you know, with Kane Velasquez, for so many years, he's been, I mean, granted, he's been on the shelf for a while, but for so many years, he was, you know, being called the next Fedor and the, this generation's big heavyweight. And after seeing him being immortalized, obviously, you're confident every time you go into the cage. But was it a bit more of a moment for you where you're like, wow, this guy, he is even more beatable than I, than uh, than you may previously have thought? Well, yeah, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, like I said, every time I walk in a cage, I, I have a game plan in my you know, watching guys in the site, you know, they have their tendencies and stuff like that. Anyone's beatable. You know, I don't care who you are. Mm. It's, it's the end of that game. <laughs> Anyone's beatable. And, uh, you know, and, you know, I, can, I, know that, and I, know, I know I can do it, and I know I can win every time. Now, it's interesting because, obviously, there's all these rumors surrounding who's going to be the next person to fight for the title. Um, Dana White's gone on record and said it looks like it's going to be between you and Andrei Olofsky. The crazy thing that it seems right now is that Andrei Olofsky, according to a lot of people, like Front Row Brian, is looking like the person who's going to jump the queue and fight for Doom for the title next. Just wondering, what did you think about these rumors? Because I'm sure you would have heard them as well. Yeah, I was, I was kind of upset a little bit, you know. <clears throat> I put my time in. I, you know, I fought, you know, top ranked guys the last couple of fights. You know, I, I, I built myself to get up to, the, get up to that level, you know, and give my shot at the title. You know, and really upset me that a guy would just jump me like that. You're ranked third, while Andre is ranked fourth. Uh, if he gets the fight over you, does it make you question what's the point in the ranking system? Because logically, the top ranked fighter should be the one who gets the next shot, right? Yes. Does it? Um, yeah. I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a very, very political answer there. I mean, stars make fights. And I, I mean, a lot of people are listening to this interview right now. And a lot of your fans are listening to this interview. If you do get a fight with Fabrizio Vadum over Andre Olovsky, what do you think your advantages over him would be? Why are you the next person to get the fight with him? Because he hasn't fought someone like me before. You know, I, I bring a lot to the table. And, you know, and I walk in there and I'm confident I'm going to win the fight. And I'm going to win the fight. I'm going to be the next really champ. Let me ask you, because we obviously don't have Dana White's number, but I'm assuming you would and a lot of fighters do, and they have their interesting ways of pitching their ideas. You know, Tyron Woodley, famous for blasting uh, Dana White's phone every time he wants a certain fight or a title shot. You know, have you done anything like that? Have you pitched it to Dana White? Have you spoken to the man personally? Uh, not personally. I didn't text, you know, because I heard that rumor about Alaska getting it, so I didn't text. I'm like, hey, you know, don't mean to bother you, but I heard a rumor that, you know, Alaska's getting a fight. Mm. And, uh, you know, so I'm not to get, but I mean, he's a busy man too, though. So. Oh, absolutely. He's got a few things going on, old Dana. Um, mm -hmm. I know you're not going to like the next question, Stipe, but I'm going to ask it anyway. The, the tough part is, if it is true and Andre Olovsky gets the next title shot, you're left in a bit of a funny situation. You've already fought a junior Dos Santos, and a fight with Overeem doesn't make much sense since he's ranked under you. So I have to ask you, who would you to pref prefer to fight? Um, if you didn't get the title shot, would it be Kane? Or who who would it be? Because you'd be left out in a bit of a weird situation. Uh, well, I'm not going to think negative, so I'm not going to say. I'm going to answer the question. I'm just going to say I want to fight Fabrizio for the title. Fabrizio. And say well, positive. Well, let's talk stylistically. You're pretty secretive. You come in with a good game plan, and thus far, you know it's it's failed you very few times. You get it done in the cage. You know what are just a few things that you do better than uh, Fabrizio Vadum? And let me t let me follow that up with you being known for your Division One wrestling. Would you utilize takedowns against him despite his ground game? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, listen, his ground game is amazing. You know, uh, his, his snatch real good too. You know, I, I'm faster than him. You know, I, I move better than him. You know, I'm better, I better stand up. I know he's really good on the ground. He's a black belt, <clears throat> but uh. No, I definitely use my wrestling. I'll be smart about it and not put myself in any bad positions. But, uh, you know, I think anywhere it goes, I'll, I'm comfortable with. And, you know, whatever he takes the table, I'll, I'll be able to handle. Wonderful. Now, before we let you go, Steve, because you know, we know how busy you are. We have to do this. We're going to do a quick tap out round with you. Basically, a bunch of fun questions. You answer with the first thing that comes to mind. Okay? Are you ready? We'll do it. All right. So you tweeted out 
Fuck it on June eighteenth. Um, now our girlfriend said we're, we're not great at reading between the lines. What did you mean by that tweet? Well, because I heard the rumor. I heard the rumor. <laughs> so that was that was you being raw. That was you expressing that Andre might get that title shot. <laughs> yeah. Moving on, someone asked you via Twitter if a hot dog is a sandwich. You replied, "Who cares? It's delicious." Now. Basically, Dennis Dennis thinks that a hot dog is still a hot dog once you put the sausage in the bread. All right, boom, there you go. There's a hot dog. Me, personally, I think a hot dog is only when you put the sausage in a hot dog bun. Can you settle this for us? What does Judge Stipe think? The Honorable Judge Stipe. I think it's whatever you think is delicious. <laughs> I like Whatever it. Whatever you want to think it is. They're delicious. They're amazing. The, the uh, battle continues between Dennis and myself and Hot Dogs. Yeah, that's it. We're going to have to keep presenting cases. Now, while, while what we're talking about, Ask Stipe, Twitter question. Someone asked you if you would, you'd ever consider being a cop instead of a fireman. Your response was, oh, my God, never. Now, this feud between the police department and the fire department that we've seen in every movie, is it real? Because we, we, we don't know anything about it, but why can't you guys just get along? Why, why is there this big feud between the police department and the fire brigade? There's no feud. There's no feud. I, I, the guys are, you know, police officers, my students I work in, they're great guys and they come by, but I think they're a little salty because they took the wrong test. <laughs> <laughs> but so, okay, so say, say you would never be a police officer. I would never be a police officer. I would be a fireman. Fair but enough. I would never put a, I would never, never burn that bridge though. I, you never know. I could be a police officer. <laughs> well, of course you wouldn't burn the bridge because then you'd have to put it out. You'd be basically making more work for yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're here all night <laughs> now when asked what superpower you'd have you answered with being invisible come on Steepa you could do better than that why such a boring superpower because why not see everything no one can see you well, well okay if you if you were invisible what, okay I think every guy listening here would probably go to like a girl's locker room or something like that would, would that be you I know you've got the I know you've got the girlfriend but let's be honest you'd be hanging around outside like a strip club going hey I'm getting it for free well, I was younger of course man. that'd be great that'd be great thing ever I'd be like sweet yeah <laughs> Oh, imagine God, uh, imagine that. That would be great. Now, your good mate, Mirko Krokop, he's looking to have a bunch of rematches. You went out and you said that you think, you know, good for him. This is what he should be. This is, If he wants it, then he should get it. What do you think is one rematch that you'd like to see Mirko Krokop have in the UFC before he calls it? Is there one person in particular you'd like to see him rematch? Yeah, even Nogueira or Nelson. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, there you go. Now, uh, Fabrizio Verdum, he's finished Fedor and Kane. Now, those are two guys that have been previously considered the greatest of all time. I know you're gunning for Fabrizio Verdum. I know you want to beat him. But do you think that puts a possible argument for him being the most accomplished heavyweights in MMA of all time? I mean, he's the best of the best, you know. So, I mean, it's, you know, it, 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 it's what we want some things, you know. I think he's amazing. I mean, he's tough, you know. He's, he's, he's going to be the best in the world. Mm. So it's it's just tough, you know. To, um, it's, yeah, it's all one person thinks because there's so many people that think one thing and another person thinks another. So now you got, you got that belt for a little while, you know, for a while. No, absolutely. Now this is an answer that you gave on Twitter to ask Steeper that really stumped us. When someone asked you if you had a favorite band, you said that you didn't. Surely this can't be true, Steeper. You should. You must have a couple of favorites that you listen to on the old iTunes. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I listen to everything in the top 40, honestly. Yeah. I do I do like Tom Petty a lot. Really? Tom like Petty? Tom Petty and but yeah, I do like them. Uh, yeah, it's good times. Um, I mean, I listen to everything. I like everything. Everything, whatever gets me in the mood, and, you know, gets me jamming, gets mad about me a little bit. What about Nickelback? Do you like Nickelback, Steve? <laughs> 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 good question <laughs> the politically yeah, correct answer back, right? <laughs> yeah yeah exactly all right finally the last question yeah. all right see we can't get a prediction out of you because you don't have a fight lined up yet but finally lebron versus jordan be honest who's greater lebron oh my god first tom petty now lebron it's like we didn't really even know you at all, Steve. We don't even know who you are anymore, Steve. Yeah, hey? you've changed, man. This <laughs> trip to Berlin's changed you. But I'll tell you what. You think hot it's dogs okay. are delicious, okay. so we forgive you. Um, thank you very much for coming on our thank program. You. We appreciate you taking out the time. Guys, you can follow Steve on Twitter, at Steve Miacic UFC. Any last words to the fans, Steve, before we let you go? Just give me a title shot. You know, tell Gary and I'm in bed. Damn, we're going to give me a title shot. That's all I care about. I love I how that's... you guys having me on. I love how that's to the fans. Give him a title shot, fans, all right? Hey, this is Ken Shamrock. You're listening to Submission Radio. 
All right, guys, our next guest hold wins over Ross Pearson, Joe Lozon, and most recently, Jorge Masvidal, and will be taking on Gilbert Melendez at UFC Fight Night 71 in San Diego. His favorite food is ice cream cake, and he's here to make the lightweight division humble. Raging Al I. Quinter, welcome back to Submission Radio. How are you, man? Uh, that's awesome. What an intro, man. That was great. We pride well, ourselves on our... On ice our, cream in- and making them humble. What more do you need? There you go. We're spouting a whole bunch of facts. Everybody knows as much as possible in as short amount of time as possible. Now, uh, let's get straight to it. You were originally supposed to fight Bobby Green. Unfortunately, Bobby got injured and pulled out of the fight. However, Bobby's replacement is Gilbert Melendez. Some people say that's a step up. How excited were you when you found out that you'd be fighting him instead? Oh, man. I was ecstatic. I was I was going I was uh I was going crazy first, you know, going crazy in a bad way once I heard Bobby Green was out and you know, you don't know who who you're gonna get. He was he's an opponent ranked above me, so you know it has really good benefits to beat a guy like that. And then to you know, I, I'm looking at the the list of guys that are ranked, and I'm like, oh man, it, it looks like you know everybody's either got a fight or they're injured and they're out. Mm. And uh, you know, I said, so, you know, I said, ah, oh, Gilbert Melendez, man, maybe he would wanna you know get uh get right back in there. So I I called my manager and I I mentioned his name uh, amongst a couple other guys of guys that I just thought were possibilities. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he took the fight and, and, uh, what a dream come true, man. It's, uh, you know, it's a guy I've been looking, watching, watching fights since I got into the sport and you always see guys on TV and you look at them, you size them up and you're, uh, you know, I'm like, I wonder how I do against these guys. And, now I'm going to get to to find out, you know, I, I, it was kind of like the same thing when I fought, uh, really my last three fights, it's the same feeling. It's, uh, it's awesome to, to, you know, get in there with guys that you, you've always wondered and mm. now, uh, you know, going in there and nah, I know I'm ready. I've, I've worked hard enough for it. So I'm, I'm ready for this opportunity for sure. Yeah, for sure. And obviously it's going to be a huge fight. Fans can't wait to see it almost. <clears throat> A dream fight in a lot of ways because fans weren't expecting it and now they get to see it. Uh, Gilbert obviously fought quite recently against Eddie Alvarez um, last weekend. I was just wondering, did you get a chance to watch the fight and what did you think about it? Because there's a lot of criticism flying his way from fans about his performance. Uh, you know, I, I saw the fight. I think the first round, I even I even tweeted out. like I was impressed by his, his hands. His jab looked awesome. His jab was fast. It was long. Um you know, in, in the first round, he looked he looked unreal, and uh, I think the altitude might have got to him, or you know, I don't know what it was, but it, you know, he kind of slowed down and and took his foot off the gas a little bit. Um, and Eddie Eddie capitalized on it. Um, yeah, it was it was a I thought it was a great fight. I thought it was a, uh, you know, a real real solid fight, and uh, you know, it it definitely gave me some uh, let let me see some some weaknesses a little bit. You know, the cardio. The cardio thing might not be a a weakness at sea level, so we're gonna have to go some other routes, and but we'll uh, we'll get the win for sure. Well, let's talk about some of those weaknesses. Obviously, Gilbert Melendez, he's a guy that's fought for the title. You're still sort of climbing up the ranks. What do you see as some of the weaknesses, and what are well, some of yeah, your advantages? Yeah, I'm definitely you know I'm young, I'm hungry, I'm I'm coming for it. I think he's been here a while, and uh, you know maybe his back's against the wall coming off a couple losses, but um, you know. I'm hungry. I've been, I've been. This is, this is what I've been dreaming about. He, I don't think he's been dreaming about a fight with number thirteenth ranked Ally Al Quinta. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been, I've been dreaming about, uh, you know, a matchup with a top five, top five guy to get me up there. So uh, I've definitely been visualizing this moment, and uh, you know, I've been visualizing it every way possible. And uh, however it, however it goes down, I'm coming out with my hand raised. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very dangerous guy, well-rounded everywhere. Just wondering, what was Ray Longo's thoughts when he found out you were fighting him? Obviously, you guys had training going for Bobby. Did you guys have to make many adjustments in your training for Gilbert? Obviously, it's quite fresh, but or is it just still going to be the same training that you had before and it's business as usual? Uh, you know, business as usual, pretty much the same. You know, we train for the, for all different guys the same way. Uh, just tweak things just a little bit, you know. I'll we'll pick a few things that that he does good, a few things that I think I can exploit, and you know, I was just training with Ray, where where uh, you know we're already ahead of the game. I think um, I uh, I definitely am in, in a great spot going into this fight. 
And in terms of Gilbert, you know, he fought, obviously, Eddie Alvarez at UFC 188. Uh, by the time he fights you, it'll be approximately a month. What do you think about that sort of time frame? Do you think it's wise to get back in the cage so soon? Will this play in your favor or against you because he's fighting so soon? Uh, you know, it could it could go either way. It could be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm guessing he's taking the fight, so he's... he's He's thinking he's in shape. He's just going to stay in shape, maintain what he, where he's at, and, uh, you know, just, just be ready for, for a fight in four weeks. And, you know, it it could be that, you know, he just really wants to get a, back in the win column. Maybe he's he's got some injuries that, that uh, he's going to have to work around. And I don't know. I'm, I'm going in there thinking he's, uh, he's 100% and, uh, you know, coming to take my head off. So I think I, I go in there. With that mentality, I'll be ready for anything. Mm. Yes, yeah, certainly. Now, obviously, Gilbert, like we mentioned, highly decorated, great fighter, one of the best, and been one of the best for a really, really long time. However, a lot of criticism coming his way because his run in the UFC hasn't really been as successful as we've seen him, you know, before in his career in Strike Force. What? Why do you think he hasn't been able to really reach the same level in, of the success that he's had before in the UFC? Al? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. He's he's had some really close fights. He's been fighting. He's been fighting the best guys in the world. And you know, when you're when you're at that level, anything can happen. Uh, I think a few decisions could have gone his way. They were they were close. Even the even this past weekend, I think you know one judge had it for him in the second round, and two had it the other way. Uh, another judge could have saw it a different way. That could have you know he could easily be uh, you know three and one in the UFC right now. I think if a few decisions went his way, but. Uh, yeah, no, it's just um, when you're fighting the best guys in the world, and and every fight, that's you know, it might happen sometimes. I uh, and I, uh, you know, I get the win in this fight, and I show that I'm one of those guys too. So mm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and I think, you know, that story, it's very similar in terms of your last fight. You beat Jorge Masvidal, uh, but a lot of people were debating the decision and talking about it, and there was a bit of controversy. What was the biggest thing you learned from that fight? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's anything that I really learned. It's just I kind of reinforced to myself that, uh, you know, this is what, this is what I'm made to do, man. I'm made to, things go bad in the first round. I, I, I can regroup. I can come back and, uh, finish strong. And, you know, I've, I've really never lost a third round in my life. And I, I definitely didn't lose that third round. And that's what I, I hold my hat on is that I'm always, I'm always in it to the end, and you know, you gotta you gotta put me away. That's the only way you're gonna win because I'm coming back. I'm coming at you. You know. Mm. Oh yeah. Obviously, you're not gonna be fighting Bobby Green. But when he was on the MMA, how Bobby Green was, he said, "There's not gonna be a way to stop. There is no stop. I'm gonna, I'm going, I'm going, and I'm going until one of our hearts falls out. Somebody better have a fucking heart attack or a knockout. That's what I'm looking for. Even though you're fighting Gilbert Melendez, is a part of you disappointed that you won't get a chance to fight Bobby? You know what? Not really. That's a, you know, he's uh, I, I don't, I still really I don't understand. I don't know what he's in there. I don't know what he's trying to do. I don't. He, it's not like a, uh, yeah. He, he, it doesn't seem like he's even in there to fight when he's fighting. He's kind of making gestures and moving around with his hands. It's not. It's not like a fight. I, I want to, you know, be in a fight. And I think this is this is great. You know, Gilbert Melendez comes to fight, and. Uh, you know that's what I'm gonna get. So I'm I'm definitely, you know, I think Bobby Bobby Green doesn't ha really know no people don't really put him under the same category in in any way of really any of the top ten guys. I think he's uh, you know I beat him. I don't think it really does does much for me. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely not uh definitely not upset at any point that I'm not gonna be fighting him. Yeah. Mm. Well, Gilbert's obviously a big name, <clears throat> and you've been on a huge tear recently with four back-to-back -back wins. If you beat Melendez, it may be likely that we'll see you know yourself with a potential title shot by the end of 2015. If things go to plan, how many more times are you open to fighting in 2015 to get that shot? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm not even, I'm not even at that point yet where I'm thinking about that. I'm just, I'm taking it one, one fight at a time, and. You know, we'll see where it goes. Uh, if it if it gets legal in New York, I'd love to fight in New York at mm. the end of the year. Um, I'd love to fight in. I think they're doing a show in Melbourne, huh? 
Oh, they absolutely are. UFC 193, December, uh, oh, sorry, November 15th. I'd love to fight in that one, and I'd love to fight in Monterey uh, in, in Mexico. So mm. uh, any any of those fights would be awesome, but I'm definitely, uh, definitely not looking past San Diego for sure. That's interesting that you say Monterey, uh, Mexico, because, you know, the UFC 188, in a lot of ways, people saw it as, I don't want to use the word disaster, but a lot of people gassed on that card. A lot of people cited the altitude. There's a big debate going on where the fighters should actually go, or the UFC should go to altitude cities like Denver and Mexico uh, because of the way the fights play. Why, why would you want to fight Mexico? Would you be well, worried about the altitude at all? Well, for, first off, I fought, I fought at Monterey. I'm fought, I, when I was an amateur, I fought in the exact arena. That mm. they're going to be fighting in Arena Monterey. Um, the the in Monterey, Mexico, it's only uh, I think it's like it, it's the altitude's less than Las Vegas. Oh. so yeah, it's not that it's not uh, it's not that high. Mexico City's Mexico City's really up there, but uh, you know Me- um, Monterey, Mexico, altitude not so much. And I've been there before, and I was an amateur. Um, I was on a card. I think it was headlined by. Hector Urbina, who was on Ultimate Fighter and now fights in the UFC. Mm-hmm. So at the time, you know, we no one had a real name, uh, but uh, these these fans in Monterey, Mexico, f- packed that arena, and uh, that was one of the craziest crowds I've still ever fought in. Um, they just love fighting, and uh, I love the uh, I love the uh, the whole spirit they have behind it. It was uh, it, w- it was a great event, and, uh, and uh, I'd love to go there again for sure. Oh yeah, well, for our for our own selfish reasons, we're gonna edit down this interview to make it just sound like you said you wanted to fight in Melbourne, so we get to see you in November. <laughs> there we now, go. Hey, now, hey, let me tell you something. I will take every opportunity I can get to come to Australia. I loved Australia too, man. Oh, that's right. If you if you thought Sydney was something, wait till you see Melbourne, especially if they do it at Etihad Stadium, fifty five, fifty six thousand people. Now, mm. um, you, I know you just said you said you didn't want to talk about title shots or anything like that but the next fight for the title looks to be between Rafael Dos Anjos and Donald Cerrone seeing as you may, may be matching up with one of them soon who do you think will win in the rematch uh you know I haven't really put much thought into it I'm gonna go I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Donald Cerrone is gonna uh is gonna pull the upset I don't know if it's gonna be an upset it probably will be I'm saying he's gonna. Uh, I'm saying he's gonna take it. I think he's in a real good spot right now. The guy's coming off a bunch of wins, and and uh, I think he's. Uh, I think he's gonna make the adjustment adjustments that he needed to to make. And uh, I'm saying he comes out with the win. Interesting. Yeah. Well, he's got a lot of momentum going into that fight for sure. Now we're gonna round out the interview out with you with the submission radio tap out round. You've done this before, I believe, twice or three times. This is where we find oh, yeah. out things like Al's favorite food is ice cream cake and other stuff like that. A uh, bunch of fun questions, and you answer with the first thing that comes to mind. You ready? Cool. All right. Let's Matt, do it. Matt, Sarah, and Dana White are doing a reality show pilot. Is there any chance Al will appear in the in the show? And have you heard anything about what they did for the first episode? No, I actually haven't heard. I know that they're. I think they're going to. I think they're going to to watch regional promotion fights, but I'm not. I could be wrong about that, and I hope so. I hope I make an appearance on. It. I think that would be great, man. We'll see though. Now speaking of Matt, he's such a funny guy. From all of your experiences with him, what's your number one standout classic Matt Sarah moment that you can share with us here on Submission Radio? The number one. Oh man, I don't think I could pick one. I think it's just. We'll take a uh, compilation. That's okay as well. <laughs> when uh, you can always tell when he's had a five-hour energy drink, and he's got a five. When he has had his five-hour energy drink, he's bouncing off the walls, and uh, he's out of his mind. And it's uh, it's entertainment, just just that in itself. I think you you, get, you give him a five-hour energy. Uh, that's that's my that's my crazy memory. Him on five-hour energy drink. We all we always see every time we've seen Matt Sarah, he always looks like he's on five hour energy drinks. When he, he was here in Sydney, is. we were actually there. It was around the time of the press conference. Actually, we we're having a brief chat with him. Um, we were actually going to interview him, and then he got whisked away by your good mate, our enemy now, Chris Weidman. Thanks a lot, Chris, because you guys had to go back to the fighters' bus. But Matt Sarah was actually making a call to his kids, I think over FaceTime or Skype or something, and the 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 decibels that he was getting, 
in the middle of like the uh, the Sydney Harbour Bridge or you know whatever the, the Opera House was just uh-huh. deafening. I think everybody just kind of stopped and stared at, at who this guy was. <laughs> yep, that would be that would be him for sure. Typical That's Matt awesome. Sarah. Now, yeah. now Aljamain Sterling released a video of him blasting music in his car, featuring you crossing the road. We imagine you and him must jump in the car together, blast the tunes around Long Island. Would that be accurate? Oh yeah, yeah, me and Joe, we have a good time, man. There's a lot to do out here in Long Island. We we uh we have some fun out here for sure. Now on May 31st, well, I, don't know vi- I don't know what video you're talking about. Oh, oh, me crossing the road. Yeah, mm. that was out front of the gym. Mm-mm. Yeah, and yeah, then, you. So so we did that, and then we look across the street, and there was one of the one of the kids' moms was getting out of the car to bring her uh pick up her son from uh from the kids' class, and she looked across the street at us like. What the hell? Usually, you know, we're all professional in the gym. We're all quite nice and everything. Here we are making a ruckus outside of the gym. She had no idea what the hell was going on. It's pretty funny. She, <laughs> he should have caught that on t- on uh, on the Instagram. Yeah. Now, Al, looking back on your fight in Virginia where the fans were booing, are you sure they were booing and not saying boo ends? Because according to Hans Molman, he was saying boo ends. <laughs> boo, boo what? Boo Burns. Burns. <laughs> Have you seen that Simpsons oh, episode no. where everyone's booing Mr. Burns and then Smith is just like, oh, I think they were saying Boo Burns. And then uh, Hans no, Molman was I, like, I, I was saying Boo Burns. I don't know if I've seen that episode. Damn, oh, man, man, I got to check that out. I'm usually a big set. I've seen a lot of the Simpsons, but uh, they, were, they, were, they were booing me. I asked them once, I asked them twice, and they were still booing, so I gave it to them. They got it. Oh, and we saw. Now, now, now I think we're cool, though. I made I made friends with them where... We're all right yeah. now. Me and me and Virginia. Yeah. Well, we we okay. saw MMA out. The, the guys called you up and you had a you had a chat with them. Well, what kind of response <laughs> can the spectators expect in San Diego if they just so happen to boo the great Al Quinta? Because bear in mind that's nah, Gil, th- that's Gil's that's Gil's hometown. There will be there won't be any booing in San Diego, man. The people of San Diego are awesome, and uh, I think it's going to be all cheers once they uh, you know see me put it all out there. Now, Al, here's an important question for you. What's your problem with facial hair? We never see you with a beard, goatee, not even a pre-fight mustache. What's going on? I don't know. I can't really grow, like, good... I have, like, little spots under... I don't know. I can't grow good facial hair, so I just keep it keep it uh, the way it is, you know? Yeah, we're born with the same affliction. You, yeah. yeah, my girlfriend suggests just use a permanent marker, but it wouldn't really, <laughs> wouldn't really match the head hair. Now, yeah. uh, one of the final questions, Al, right? If UFC Fight Night 71 had a name like some of the old UFC cards, what name would you pick? And just to get you in the mood, here are some classic examples, right? And these are actual names. We weren't making these up, right? They include UFC Fight Night 26, Ultimate Field of Dreams. It's a field of dreams. UFC 27, Ultimate Bad Boys. And that's with a Z at the end. And then UFC 47, It's On. So what would you pick for UFC Fight Night 71 out? What's what's the crazy title? The crazy title UFC 71 in San Diego. San Diego, California. I don't know. Who let the dogs out is a good one. There you go. Who UFC Fight Night 71 who let the dogs out. <laughs> who, let, who let the dogs out? <laughs> dogs with a Z. Were, the beat we'll go with the Beach Boys and I wish they could all be California girls. UFC, yeah. <laughs> UFC 71, I wish they could all be California girls. Yeah, there you go. The marketing, the UFC marketing team would be like, huh, why didn't we ever think of that? That's a great night. <laughs> you know, Katy Perry performing with Snoop Dogg, it, it would be a great night. Now, let's there we go. Let's finish this up, Al, with a, with a prediction. You just found out quite recently you'll be fighting Gilbert Melendez. Give us your prediction. How do you see yourself beating him at Fight Night 71? Uh, oof, how do I see myself beating him? I'm just going to uh, – I think I'm going to open a lot of people's eyes, man. I think this is a great fight for me to uh, to really put on a great dominant performance. There you go, guys. Don't forget to watch Raging Ally Quinta at UFC Fight Night 71 take on Gilbert Melendez on July 15th. Uh, due to the time difference, it'll be July 16th here in Australia. Al's climbing the ladder. And, of course, follow him on Twitter at Al Iaquinta. Uh, man, thanks so much for coming on the show. We always appreciate it. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. You're listening to Submission Radio. Stay tuned or I'll snap your arms off. Our next guest is one of the most entertaining heavyweights in the world, beating Matt Mitrion via first round submission. He climbs up the ladder, getting one step closer to a title shot. The man with possibly one of the best walkouts in UFC history, Ben Rothwell, welcome back to Submission Radio. Well, thank you for having me back. 
It's an absolute pleasure. It's great to have you back on the show. We've been uh, dying to chat to you. Now, Ben, before you stepped in the cage against Matt Mitrione, it seems like a lot of the momentum that you got after your Overeem win has disappeared as you're away from the cage for so long due to injury. Now, Alistair Overeem himself went on to win a bunch of fights, getting back up there in the rankings. Alofsky made a comeback and went up in the rankings. How difficult was it for you to have to sit back and watch the heavyweight division while having to recover from injury? It's just part of the game. I, I knew that I was okay. As long as I didn't take longer than a year, I knew that with a great performance, I would remind everybody of what's going on. And as you can see, that that's exactly what happened. Uh, even more more so than a reminder, I, I think I, I kicked the, the door down and throwing my name into the hat. Uh, right now, you look at every post about a title contention, they're naming you know, the same six guys, you know, and I'm one of them. So we're in the mix, and it's a pretty exciting time to be a heavyweight. Mm. Oh, yeah, absolutely, in the mix. And we just want to talk about how you got yourself in there. Obviously, you had one of the most impressive entrances that we've ever had the pleasure of watching on TV with the UFC. Tell us, how did you come up with the idea? What were you channeling with your inner Sith Lord, and where did you get the rope from? <laughs> inner Sith Lord. I don't know. I, my song, just to clear it out, a lot of people call it Star Wars. It, it was from Brian Stoker's Dracula. It's an orchestrated song, and it's very powerful to me. As far as coming in and the things that I said after, you're going to see with each of these fights that, that there was no acting. There was no script. It was just me finally deciding that, you know, I'm going to be me. You know, I, I just need to to, know, to show, like I, I said this in a couple of interviews, no, I'm not going out there. This isn't fake. Mm. This is real. We're really out there to hurt each other. And my objective is to get in there and be the scariest human being alive. You know, we're, we're, we're monsters right now. We're the heavyweight divisions of some of the toughest human beings on this planet. And I'm here to take them out. So I have to step up my game. And that's what entered the, the cage the other night. Yeah, I think Monster's probably the perfect way to describe it. You know, before you beat Matt Mitrion, you seem to take a few seconds to just stand in the center of the octagon, take some shots, and almost just absorb his punches. And then it seemed like a switch was hit, and you became very animated, and the footwork started. You know, what was going through your mind during that moment where you basically, you know, stood in front of him and just absorbed shots? Well, Jack Slag, actually, he's, he's a very smart writer. He's been doing some videos on boxing, and, and he... uh I was impressed. It's not something I really wanted to get out there, but I'm impressed by his knowledge. And mm. you guys got to really, you got to rewatch my fight and you got to do it in slow motion. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks that I was getting tagged and it's just not the case. My defense was uh, the best it's ever been. And I scored several shots through that, that I know that, that changed his thought process. I mean, he really didn't get hit in his last three fights and I hit him several times and I'm telling you, your game plan changes when you start getting hit. And I'm, I'm weight wise, I'm the biggest heavyweight. That means I'm the biggest fighter in the UFC. And you get hit by me, believe me, it makes a difference. No, absolutely. And Jack Slack, obviously one of the best guys out there, agree with you on that one. Now, you ended up submitting uh, Matt with a go go choke. Most people predicted if you beat Matt, it would be by a knockout. Did you plan on submitting him? And were you surprised at all how the victory came and the double tap, that, uh, that notorious double tap that now has made history in the heavyweight division? No, let me let me clear up one thing. Who my next opponent's going to be? What happens in the cage? Any of these things? Any of these questions you have? What happened in the last heavyweight uh, championship? Nothing surprises me. Okay, first let's just clear that. Second thing is, I go in to win a fight, and I'm gonna uh, and I, no no. Let me rephrase that. I go in to end my opponent. Mm. Okay, I, it's, uh, my my winning ratio shows that I finish fights. I finish them in the first round 28 times out of 35. It's it's what I do. If come knockout, come submission, you're going to see when I say I'm well-rounded, you're going to see just, just what I mean by that. And the top five heavyweights you're going to talk about right now, it doesn't matter who I get matched up with. I, I really, I'm telling you, I'm in a different place right now. It does not matter. I know what I'm here to do, and I'm going to do it. Well, it looks like you're definitely there to make statements. And when you beat Matt Mitra and you made another statement, you cut an epic promo that ended with an evil laugh. These epic promos for me, they seem to have become a bit of a signature from you. You know, you went for something impactful and then John Anik ushered you back to ask some questions. Were you disappointed that he didn't let you walk away and just end it there after the laugh? Yeah, I mean, that was kind of, I said it, you know, he didn't listen to me. I said, mm. I have nothing left to say. So yeah. he immediately he walked over. You can see I'm I'm kind of stunned. I'm like, why is this guy walked over here? You know, and I think I caught everybody off guard. 
Mm. I, I really did. I don't think he even knew how to handle it. And he tried to be super cool at the end. He said, you know, get back to Rothwell and to me. Anyone that's been watching me or talking to me the last, you know, few months, because I, I kind of closed down before my fights, but what interviews they got out of me, it's all about my gym. Mm. You know, so if you want to respect me, talk about my gym, because it's, I'm, I feel like I'm making history. You know, I, I, I don't just own a gym. I teach my classes all week long. Um, we have a very special thing and we're in a small part of Wisconsin, you know, it's, it's Kenosha, Wisconsin, like where's that? And, uh, I don't have any high profile coaches like, you know, Craig Jackson or the black zillions yet. I'm beating their, their fighters. So I think that I have something very special and unique going on right now. Oh no, absolutely. And obviously a place to be now for a lot of aspiring MMA fighters, getting an opportunity to train, with the great Ben Rothwell and finding out, you know, some of your techniques and ideas, because obviously you've been around to all the best training camps, have been around the sport for a really long time. And we'll ask you a few questions actually about your gym a little bit later. I just want to touch on something else, Ben. Um, when you were on Ariel's show, MMA Hour, you made a few comments about Cain Velasquez and the heavyweight division in regards to PEDs and whether Cain would look the same upon his return. You clarified on Inside MMA that you were just being sarcastic and that you didn't mean anything by it which obviously cleared up a lot of stuff. But I'm just wondering, having seen Kane's return at UFC 188, you mentioned that nothing surprises you anymore, but what did you think about his latest performance? Because a lot of people did think he didn't quite look the same. Well, MME Junkies, Ben Folks, just did an article, and it talks, um, he, he obviously couldn't put everything that I said. He emphasized on me talking about Kane's cut, how I fought in elevation, and how I you know, knew what he was going through. But the important part that was missed is everything was people aren't giving Verdum enough credit. That's what upset me. If you listen to my interview, the very first thing I talk about is Kane had his hands full. You know, there was no surprise to me. Everybody's like counting Verdum out. And if you listen to my interview, I'm like, yeah, right. I knew, I knew Kane had his hands full. I knew that Verdum is a legitimate heavyweight. He's one of the best in the world for, for a reason. Look, he proved it again. I knew the man was preparing very well. And I couldn't emphasize that enough that people need to give credit when credit's due. And that part didn't get put in there. So that was the first thing. And, you know, then after that being, you know, said, okay, there is a lot of factors here, the elevation, all the guys puking on themselves. Obviously, common sense says there are some factors here. But I also said, you know, for say, you know, they're like, well, would you have done something different with the training? I go, who the hell am I to tell Cain Velasquez how to train? You know, he's mm -hmm. a champion. He knows what he's got, what he's doing. You know, just like Pete me, I don't want people telling me what to do. Obviously, I know what I'm doing, doing this for 16 years. I know a thing or two, you know, and I entrust that he does. Say he fought Travis Brown. I have no doubt in my mind Cain would have smashed Travis in the first round, been the hero of Mexico, and nobody would have thought nothing of it. But he fought a much tougher opponent in Verdum, and you know things things change when you fight a tough guy. So that's my thoughts on that whole thing. Well, yeah, it definitely seemed like Verdum did everything he possibly could to prepare, and he's obviously changed in the last few years and become a much better version of himself. There's still the debate going on as to whether or not Kane would have won the fight if it were, if it were at sea level. Sounds like you're pretty confident in Verdum. What do you think? Do you think the fight would have played out any different if it would have been at sea level and not Mexico? I don't think so. I mean, I just stated that I think Verdun trained to win the fight regard wherever it was going to be. Mm. And I just don't think that it was going to change because the bottom line is, if you watch Keane's history, he doesn't respect guys' ground game. He fights differently. Well, that did not occur with Verdun. He was backing off. He didn't go into the guard. And the very first time he really committed to a takedown, you know, he got choked. A couple of times Verdun laid down, you know, say, hey, come on, let's fight. And, and, and Kane just had him stand back up. So, no, I don't think – the elevation didn't make Cain let Verdum stand back up, mm. okay? That was his conscious choice, and he got worked on the feet. So, no, I don't think the fight was going to change. Well, you make an interesting point about Verdum. Obviously, not many people respecting him, and he's really improved his game, and a lot of people need to recognize that with him finishing guys like Cain and Fedor Emelianko, one of the greatest of all time. Just wondering, you just you know mentioned you're one of the top six guys that could possibly be fighting for a title next, and who knows what's going to happen in the crazy world of the UFC. Now, Vadum has been untouchable on the ground. You, you tapped out Metreon very, very quickly a couple of weeks ago. What do you think? Could you be the man to challenge or even submit Vadum on the ground? Because you just spoke about the fact that a lot of guys are too afraid to go down when he's lying on his back sort of with his guard open. I mean, I'm trying to be very clear that I'm on a different level, you know, but first and foremost, they're just words. It doesn't mean anything. I want to prove everything I say. Now, if and when I do fight Verdum, I want the world to know it. He, as far as I'm concerned, he's the baddest heavyweight on the planet. 
I want him to know he is the toughest challenge to date so that when I beat him, people understand exactly what I've done. Well, it seems like, uh, you know, obviously seeing as Verdu, you say he's the toughest man on the, or the baddest man on the planet. He's essentially the new sheriff in, in the heavyweight town. A lot of people are happy that he's the sheriff because obviously Cain Velasquez has spent a considerable amount of time on the shelf. Do you think this opens up the division at all, Like much like when GSP left the welterweight division and guys like, you know, yourself? And, well, uh, we have to go by history. If Cain won again, there's a high probability Cain was going to take some time off, be injured, whatever the case is. I'm just speaking from facts. The history since 2010. Hmm. I do believe that Verdun was being champion. He's going to fight us. He's eager to fight. And he's going to fight us guys that are ready and staying healthy. And some people say, you know, I made a whole uh, call out to uh, El, you know, Andre Olaski. Junior DeSantis is, 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 is the guy last guy on a win and ranked the highest. So technically that would be a good fight to call. But he made an announcement that he was injured. And then he made he made comments about El over him, calling him out only because he was injured. So I didn't do that. Mm. I didn't. I, I tried to strategically call out what I thought made was what common sense was saying. But you know, any of these guys that are up there right now, you know, you're talking Verdum, Kane, G- JDS, Andre Olaski, Stipe. I think any one of them is going to build a good case for myself. So it really doesn't matter in the grand schemes of things. And I'm absolutely prepared for any one of them because that's how the UFC rolls. They're going to do whatever. So we've got to be prepared for anything. I've tried to build a strong case by Andre Lofke. I think the fight makes sense. I think if, if Verdum is waiting till the end of the year and that's when Junior said he's going to be ready, well, then I guess those two will fight. It doesn't matter to me, though. Whatever happens, I think any one of the opponents is a worthy opponent and it's going to help me build my case. Yeah, no, absolutely. And obviously, just on the Olofsky fight, you two actually fought before. Fans might not know because it wasn't in the UFC, but Olofsky beat you. He ended your 13-fight win streak. And obviously, you two have a lot of respect for each other, especially after having a war uh, like you two did. But just wondering, if you did get an opportunity to rematch Arlovsky, how do you think it would play out differently? What would you do differently from that fight? I can't tell you just exact fight, you know, logistics, sure. but I'm telling you that when he fought me, you know, I was a boy. I mean, in the fighting realm, I had a lot of fights, I had a lot of there, but mentally, I was a boy. I just am not who I am now. I went past being a man, and I am just something else completely. As far as to say, I just have said this before, I'm the martial artist that I always dreamed of being. And I need Andre Lasky to face me so he can, he, he deserves to see what I can really do. He deserves to see me at my best because he didn't. And I got to watch him get his shot to go on and take on Fedor, who at the time was thought of as the best heavyweight ever. Mm. So he got that shot. So I feel like I deserve my shot. And then we're going to fight again. And if he beats me again, fine, so be it. But Obviously, I'm doing what I'm doing for a reason. Well, that's definitely a fan-friendly contest. You mentioned about him getting the shot. It looks like he will be the next in line for the title shot. Rumors are spreading that he's gotten the call to face Verdum. Do you think he was the right guy given his win streak? You know, Do you think maybe you could have been the one to challenge Verdum? Or it seems like you're sort of eager to face anybody that would get you to the title shot. Did you expect you would need one more fight? Yeah, I mean, common sense just says I'm, there's these couple of guys are in front of me, ranked higher, and I'm, you know, it's just, it's just the way it is. Like they would all need to get injured, and there had to be nobody. Then maybe I'd get a shot. I just feel like common sense just says the way it is. Like, yeah, a couple of these guys are in front of me, and I need to be one of them. It's, it's interesting how you say that because it's funny. You just never know what's going to happen in the game of MMA and who's available and who's not. And obviously, you just mentioned that you don't care who you face. There's obviously a handful of guys that you would be fighting next. How important is it for you to get in the cage soon? You've been out of action for quite a while before your last fight. Not too soon. Not too soon. See, what became a long time to a lot of people was actually short. See, this was nine months. You know, I've taken, I've been, I've had a year and uh, 14 month layoffs for the last six years. Mm. So I went from being one of the most active heavyweights on the planet, fighting 11 times in 2002. And in the course of 2006 to 2007, I fought nine times. That's September to September, and those were televised fights. So that means that they were tougher. They weren't just chump fights. Mm. That was like televised big deal fights. I did nine of them in one year. So that's, you know, I was, I was very active at certain parts of my career. Now things have changed. You know, I'm 35 and nine. I've, you know, I feel like I'm an ancient as far as fighting experience, but I'm 33. So in the heavyweight division, I'm not doing too bad. I'm, I'm, I'm more in my prime. 
and I feel like I know what I'm doing. You know, nine months is nothing to me. Nine months is, is no big deal. I'm, I'll am i get in the cage and act like I didn't miss a beat. You know, a year and a half, uh, that I wouldn't like that so much. Mm-hmm. And three months is too quick. Two, three months is too quick. Six months is even makes me like uh, nine months is good. I like nine months to a year. I mean, I think nine months is just right. That's what I've experienced. Fair enough. Well, it seems like you're right. You probably would be fighting possibly Stipe Miocic or Junior Dos Santos. And if you win that fight, you may be going on to fight either Arlovsky or Verdum. How do you see that fight playing out? Who do you think comes out on top? You mentioned Verdum's the baddest man on the planet. You fought Arlovsky. You know what he's made of. Who do you think wins that one? Well, I mean, this is MMA. You know, there's no surprises, like I said. But I would expect Verdum to win. He's got the uh, he's got the well-roundedness aspect. I think filled out a little better. So we'll see. We'll see. People can make improvements. We'll see when the fight actually gets announced and how long they have in between. And let's hope that I get JDS then if that's the case because, you know, he'll be ranked the highest guy ranked that's not fighting the title. So the highest guy that's that's also not on a loss. You know, people are like, what about Kane? Yeah, that's, that's guy obviously going to be a very good fight too. But I would like to fight somebody on a one as well. Again, we'll see what happens. Now, uh, before we jump to the tap out round, Ben, we just want to quickly have a chat about your gym. Obviously, this is something that you spoke about at the start of the interview where you're there, you're training guys, you're passing on your knowledge. It's a great place to be. And it sort of slipped under the radar a little bit in the sense that, you know, people haven't really been talking about it as much. Tell us, how much do you enjoy being a coach and a trainer? Because obviously, you were first a fighter and now you're a coach, trainer and fighter. How much do you enjoy the aspect of being a coach and a trainer? It's part of my training now because I kind of watch them. They watch me, you know, and it's, it's, it's very interesting because what happens is the same things that I need to reiterate to myself, hap- it happens because I'm, I'm reiterating it to them. Every time I tell them, it's like I'm telling myself. And, and they listen to me because I'm very open-minded. And I try to be very open and transparent about things that I'm saying. I'm very, very big on using my life and experience as the example especially my losses and especially my failures. That's the things I always bring up the most. I'll be like, don't do this because this is what happened to me. You know, it's one thing someone says, don't do that. Well, why? I don't know because I said don't do it. That's not that's not acceptable for me. Hmm. When I show a technique, someone goes, why would you use that technique? And if I look at you with the blank spirit and say, I don't know, I watched some guy do it, That's it gets thrown out. If I can't technically give you a, an answer and then common sense tells you, ah, that makes sense, then it's no good. So a lot of what I do is what makes me, it's just why I'm getting so much better. I mean, I'm constantly reiterating things to myself. You know, if I tell them something, I'm telling myself and nobody's above it. It's not like I'm telling you this and then I go and keep my hands dropped right after. Well, somebody better call me out then. Somebody better like, hey, Ben, you just told us to keep your hands up. Why are you keeping your hands down? No, that you know, like I said, it's transparent. Like everybody's on an equal. When we walk into my gym, I'm not Ben Rothwell, the whatever ranked heavyweight in the world. I'm Ben Rothwell. And don't ever forget that. Like you leave your ego at the door. We don't give a shit about who you think you are. It doesn't it's not like that. We all have flesh and blood and we're equal. And it's the only way you can step into my gym. And if you can't handle that, you don't come there. And you've got a bunch of problems and anguish and whatnot, you leave it outside. When you come into the gym, that's your freedom from that. And when you start, when you're able to talk to each other like that, you talk to each other in a different way, you hear more information. You can learn. If you take yourself off of your high horse and you can actually listen to the people that are around you that see you every day, wow, you'd be amazed how many things you can learn. But if you're constantly, you know, trying to talk down to people and block things out, well, people, they don't know, they don't grow them. So the gym has given me all, all these things, this, this, this mentality that I have. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you what, we've been to a bunch of gyms across sort of Australia, and there's a lot of issues like that in those gyms. So it's great that you sort of put it like that. I wish uh, he had a gym here in Australia. We definitely hit it up. Now, mm. final question before we jump to the tap out round. Obviously, there was a bit of controversy around some comments that you made about the UFC. You cleared them up. You apologized and explained that you were just a bit excited and that you wanted to be at the Fan Expo to connect with your fans. Just wondering, are there any updates? Are you going to be at the Fan Expo? Have you had a chance to speak with Dana about it? What's going on? Um, I, it, nothing to do with the UFC. It's just that I have some, I have some help. Some friends are bringing me out. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it out to the, to the UFC Fan Expo. Um, 
you know, just kind of get my own own way out there. You know, I may not be inside the expo, but I'll be I'll be there on the streets and kind of doing my thing, whatever I can do to see the fans. LUB MMA, uh, you know, Australian company news site. I highly check, tell you guys to check them out. They're uh, they're the ones that help giving me out there because they're all about the fighters and they just want to help build the sport. And Dan Cox uh, is one of our representatives too. These guys put in all the effort to get me out there. So they're uh, they they care about the fans and they really love the sport. So we're gonna get out there and I'm just gonna do whatever I can for the fans and try to make contact. And you know, I just want to put myself out there because it's the fans that that made this all possible. It really is. It's the reason that we got the opportunity to fight. And uh, let me tell you, when I was younger, 1998, before I started the sport, uh, fighting on the streets didn't go over well. You know, puts you in prison and it gets you in trouble and it was just no good. And MMA is what I found. I was 17 years old and I started fighting in 1999 and uh, it saved my life. So that's that's a fact. And God knows that in my heart when I mean it. I truly, truly owe the sport my life and I'll give it my life. And that's where I'm at. Wow. Sound advice from Ben Rothel, guys. Obviously, if you see him uh, at the Fan Expo on the streets, don't be shy. Go say hi. Uh, we're going to let you go in a second, but before we do, we're just going to finish the interview with the tap out round. Ben, you did one with us last time. We just throw a bunch of fun questions at you, and you answer with the first thing that comes to your mind, kind of like word association. Are you ready? Sure. All right, cool. The Joker, Dr. Doom, Darth Vader, or Darth Sidious? Who's your favorite evil genius and why? Darth Sidious. He was in control. Remember, Darth Vader was his, uh, his puppet. That's Darth true. Darth Sidious is the one that had the you know he played both roles what a what a genius uh lucas was for putting that story together it showed like there it is the dark side was right there acting like they were your friend and uh secretly taking over the universe right in front of you hmm. Pretty now, powerful you're, stuff you're close you're really close friends with pat militage yourself and him are always going back and forth with some hilarious tweets uh what was his reaction to your entrance we imagine he must have loved it yeah, he didn't. I didn't hear anything. Some of my old teammates, Mike, seen stuff. They were like, "Oh, it was awesome," you know. But no, it's just insane. And then they interviewed him inside of me. He just said, "Well, man, for Ben, guy's got a bit of a temper." So <laughs> funny because that's what they remember of me freaking out on people. So come on, Militich, give us give us the goss on the on the entrance. Now, Ben, having your own school, is there a secret evil laughing class that only longtime students know about? When I did it, my my school was like, "Yeah, that's Ben." <laughs> that's why every like some of the girls in my class today you know they have a great time in our classes because we like to we teach but we try to have a good time and yeah I, obviously i'll crack that off when i'm feeling good or whatever the situation is so to them they were like yeah that's ben you know <laughs> they weren't surprised so it was kind of funny mm. now the, here's a serious question ben we're going to talk about robes and what kind of robe you're working with in the entrance we prefer velvet and satin robes here at submission radio but silk robes are also good what material were you working with and most importantly was it breathable uh nothing is hot okay <laughs> so i don't know what the material is but it was de- definitely some satin i think because there was some shine to it it had like a sheen that i think kenny florian even made comments about so yeah, definitely. Now, final question, Ben. Uh, just to wrap up the interview, you're an inspirational character. You're a fantastic fighter. What's one secret power that Ben Rothwell has that people don't know about? Hmm. That'd be my intuition. My my, my my fighters especially will tell you is that I can get a good gist of what you're all about within the first five minutes of talking to you. Well, there you go. It's it's something good that definitely has helped you throughout your career and throughout your fights. Guys, don't forget to follow Ben on Twitter, at Rothwell Fighter. There's a lot of fake Twitter accounts. At Rothwell Fighter is the official one. And, of course, check out Ben's gym, Rothwell MMA. Uh, we hope you make it to the Fan Expo, Ben. And uh, if you see him, don't forget to come say hi. Again, thanks so much for coming on Submission Radio, Ben. Thanks a lot, guys. And I want to thank, uh, thank the area, you know, and thank, uh, thank all over the world for, for getting this word out here, man. That's why I love the sport so much. It's not just about our countries it's just this whole world man we're putting it together and we got fighters from all over the world we got media from all over the world and that's just gonna make this take the sport to the top so thank you guys for doing what you do it's our pleasure ben and thank you for coming on submission radio what a pleasure having ben rothwell on submission radio casper no doubt one of the most entertaining figures in the heavyweight division of the ufc maybe in all of mma i can't stop watching the guy there's something about him he's got a certain mystique about him and he's got the skill to back it up certainly makes the heavyweight division that much more exciting in 2015. Ah, oh, I couldn't have said it better. I think I think it's the mystique factor, the robe, the everything, pretty much everything that we talked about in this interview that makes Ben Rothwell one of the hottest guys to watch. But it's a bit of a shame that he's not going to be around for the next nine nine months to a year. 
I really would like to see Ben Rothwell come back and, you know, strike while the iron is hot. But I don't know, maybe maybe as they say, uh, what is it that makes the, the heart grow fonder? Distance or something? Yeah, right. that's it. And I mean, I mean we, we've we've said it to the girlfriends before, but it just doesn't go down well. Yeah, yeah. Time apart, <laughs> time apart makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah. Um, the girlfriends have never once fallen for for that old trick, but you know, one day when they're seeing. Maybe we should maybe. get him to go uh, train with Ben Rothwell. Maybe yeah, exactly. It's one of the things he teaches uh, evil laughing class and how to uh, take a break from things. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk. There's obviously a couple of events to talk about. Uh, it, it was a dream come true for MMA fans this weekend. You have UFC Berlin on Fight Pass, and then you had Bellator 138. Uh, lots of talk about for I'd say more Bellator than UFC. So this time it's going to be a first. We're actually going to talk about the UFC first. We're going to get that over and done with, and then we're going to cut to Bellator 138 and talk about that. I honestly think that's the card that has a lot more things to talk about in terms of the in terms of the UFC Berlin. I'm just going to kick it off. Peter Sabota, Steve Kennedy. This is the first fight that I want to talk about. The prelims, there were some fun prelims, and you had Nick Hine versus Wukash uh, Saevsky. Good times all around, but this is the fight that I really wanted to kick it off with. Steve Kennedy was kind of like, I don't want to say the last great hope, but he was the latest great hope for Aussie MMA coming from Western Australia. He's been really big on the Aussie scene for many, many years. It was a big deal. We spoke to some guys in regards to Steve Kennedy and management and things like that, and here he comes making his debut on short notice against Peter Sabota, Polish guy. So you got a Polish guy and an Aussie guy. Uh, I mean, I was confused as hell as far as who to go to. I'm just kidding. I really didn't care. I just wanted a good fight. Peter Sabota got the win. The great Australian hope shut down for now. What did you think of the fight, Dennis? Yeah, well, you know, it was a tough fight for Steve. Peter looked great. You know, my congratulations go out to him. He had a great, great finish. Very impressed with his jiu-jitsu IQ, being able to uh, really get those legs around Steve and lock him in before getting that rear naked choke in. It was it was a very, very impressive victory for him. I was very, very pleased. I believe uh, post-fight, he even grabbed the mic and had a bit of a chat to the crowd, which is which is interesting because usually you know the announcer in the octagon won't let the mic go, but had a really nice moment with with Steve Kennedy. Just for all the listeners out there in the US, UK, and all around the world, you know, like you mentioned, a big big name here in Aussie MMA. And when I heard he was coming into the UFC, I was very excited because we have a lot of great fighters here from Australia. But Steve, without a doubt is one of the most skilled. He's had experience in a lot of areas, and you guys would have heard all the black belts that he had and all the different martial arts and the competitions that he's won. I think it was a case of very short notice for him going all the way to Berlin, very, very short camp, I suppose. They did mention he was preparing for a boxing match of all things. So I think we will see his potential in the next fight. It's one of those things where you take a fight short notice so they can have another fight in the UFC with a proper camp. And I'm hoping we see some some of that potential out of him because I, I personally saw him with some uh, with an amazing finish at Hex earlier this year. He's had a lot of very, very interesting wins. And he's a very charismatic guy. Behind the mic, he can really talk. So hopefully he can get a win and show the world what he can do. I couldn't agree with you more. And I don't want to sound biased, but Steve Kennedy, he's a very, very confident guy. I think you'd agree with that, Dennis. And at the start of the fight, he looked incredibly stiff, incredibly tense uh, on the feet. He loosened up a little bit once the fight went on the ground. And that's when I kind of thought once he got out of the choke initially, I thought he was free. And then Peter Sabata, you know, he's he's so good on the ground that he ended up getting it on Steve anyway. I was a little bit surprised. I thought Steve would, uh, would sort of wave him off for, for longer and possibly even stand up. But I do think it might be a case of octagon jitters. Uh, like I said, he looked incredibly tense on the on the feet when it started. And I think even though he was training for a boxing fight, and that does give him certain advantages, it's not like he was sitting on the couch eating Fritos. I think the rhythm is different in terms of obviously MMA and boxing and Muay Thai and all that kind of stuff. So I, don't, I think he had the fitness on his side, but I'd, obviously he wasn't prepared for an MMA fight. So I really hope this, the, the UFC will give him another shot. And I think they will. He would have been, I'm, I'm assuming, on at least a two or three fight fight contract um so i think the real steve kennedy is the guy that we'll see in the next fight yeah and someone that people really need to watch out for who knows what's going to happen on the prelims of the melbourne card and what's going to happen but if they do put some aussies on there i expect steve to be on there now Cass, the co-main event of the evening kawajiri versus siva now siva 
quite notoriously, no pun intended, lost to Conor McGregor quite recently. It was a fight where I gave Seaver a bit of benefit of the doubt, thinking that maybe he could make the big upset. Obviously, he's been around for a really long time, a guy who's handy in a lot of areas. Ground game is actually pretty good. People don't expect that from him. Obviously, an amazing kickboxer. Kawajiri, a legend, uh, fought for many, many years against the best of the best. What did you think of this fight? Because this was sort of a fight for a lot of the diehard fans that really have a lot of knowledge about the MMA game. Yeah, I don't know if I'd call Dennis Seaver an amazing kickboxer. I think he's definitely a guy that gets it done, but he's not exactly known for going in there and absolutely demolishing people on the feet like, say, uh, Ioanni Andrzejczyk, who we'll be talking about a little bit later. You're absolutely right. This is a battle of legends, and it was kind of like who can cling on to and stay relative in the featherweight division. Uh, Kawajiri took the win. Really unfortunate for Dennis Seaver. Obviously, like you said, he lost against Conor McGregor. This is his hometown, Berlin. Well, actually, he's a man of two hometowns. He was born in Russia, but he is German. So he's kind of like, I don't know, a day walker, if you will. And to lose to Kawajiri, it kind of, not to say that it seals the coffin on his career, but it's just his best success came in the lightweight division. And since coming down to featherweight, it's really been mixed results. You know, he beat Diego Nunes and Nam Fan, and then he lost to Cub Swanson. He beat Charles Rosa, and then he lost to Conor McGregor, now Kawajiri. So, you know, I think his hopes of competing for the title, they're not coming around anytime soon. I think that pretty much closes the, uh, the possibility for that. You know, he looked good in the first round, and I think this is actually really, really close fight until Kawajiri eventually got him down to the ground and then basically wrote out the decision. In my opinion, it wasn't the most exciting fight. Kawajiri did enough for what he had to do and he was super elated after the fight ended. He was super happy with the victory and I understand because Kawajiri obviously he lost to uh, to Clay Guido. Many people were talking about how he should possibly hang it up. So for him to get this win, it was a big deal, but it, he definitely didn't get it in exciting fashion. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you there. I, I was excited personally from a jiu-jitsu nerd standpoint just seeing how he advanced on the ground some interesting passes from Kabujiri, especially from half guard to mount um some great stuff there but i, I was gonna say i think siva maybe should go back up and wait because i think his biggest issue is he's just a little bit too slow i think he's a bit too slow for the division and the guys in the division are even faster than the division he was in before so even though he gains uh, bonus size. At the same time, I think he's very slow. He's got some great techniques, some great spinning back kicks. Obviously, we saw him today. Couldn't land him flush. Some good combinations. And obviously, he's a past champion when it comes to striking. But he's just a bit too slow, I feel like, for the division. Against Con Conor McGregor, obviously, he looked very, very slow. Here, he looked quite slow with some of his punches. And I think it could be a case of the guys just being too quick for him. Um, he has a lot of muscle, a lot of muscle mass. And that makes it difficult sometimes for guys like him because he does look like a big piece of muscle sometimes. I just don't see that explosive striking from him that he needs sometimes to really get that win. I don't know. What do you think, Cass? I see what you're saying. I agree. He is a big, sexy piece of meat. I think he hit the nail <laughs> on the head. <laughs> um, That's but exactly what I was saying. I, I kind of disagree in this sense because as I was watching the fight, Kawajiri, he's not a fast guy himself. And you're absolutely right. Dennis Seaver doesn't have the speed. He's the type of guy that he sort of focuses a little bit more on wrestling these days. And this is actually a rare instance where he did focus on his striking. I think because Kawajiri is, is a really good grappler. I think in this case, though, I was looking at him thinking, damn, man, like he's... He's got a lot of muscle on him, but his actual frame, his bones, they're not really that big. I think, I don't see him going to bantamweight anytime soon. I, actually, I don't think that'll ever happen. But if he could lose the muscle, I I don't know. I, I guess he wouldn't necessarily fare better because the guys would be faster. But just in terms of his frame, like he's got short arms, got short legs. He's a short guy. You know, the way he's, his stance, he's, he's good on his feet. Like he, he's very light. He bounces around a lot, but... I don't know. I just think sometimes that reach kills him a little bit. When you got guys like Conor McGregor and uh, Jose Aldo and, uh, you know, just other guys in general with decent reaches, those guys are always going to give him trouble unless he can really close in. So, I don't know. I, I think he's sort of stuck in no man's land. He can't go to the bantamweight division because I don't think he could ever make the weight cut and uh, those guys would kill him with speed. I think in the featherweight division... These guys at the moment are, you know, sometimes killing him with speed as well. And I think in the lightweight division, these guys are just too big for him. And then the reach advantage just gets even worse. So I, I don't know what you do with a guy like Dennis Seaver. You know, I would say keep him around. I'm not, and I'm not saying the UFC should get rid of him or anything like that. But, you know, you think keep him around for the Germany cards. And that's exactly what they did. And then he lost to a, a guy like Kawajiri, who in all honesty 
is nowhere near as relevant as he as he was in past years. So, you know, I think Dennis Siva's career is somewhat coming to an end. I think he's going to continue fighting. He's going to take fights. Um, but I, I don't see him ever becoming a champion or, you know, necessarily even a contender. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you. And also, just knowing what to expect from him, he does have the same sort of tricks every fight. And now the fighters are sort of expecting that spinning kick and a lot of the stuff that mm. he does that does finish the fight quickly. It's sort of tougher for him to reach in there and find something new to really surprise the fighters with. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what he does. I'd like to see something drastic from him, either, like you mentioned, maybe dropping some of that muscle and fo- focusing more on cardio, uh, adding some more tricks to his bag, or I don't know. I mean, obviously the reach, like you mentioned, a big uh, detriment in light lightweight, but that's where he had the most success. So. Interesting to see what happens with him. I think the UFC will keep him around for another fight, but if he loses one more, it could be walking papers for old Dennis, which would be a shame because... You know, he's been a part of the UFC for a really long time now. I see. I don't. I don't think the UFC would necessarily release him because I think they tend to release more guys that are like wrestling heavy, you know, arsenals. And at least Dennis Siva, he does have fairly exciting fights. I didn't love this fight to be honest, but at least he's content to strike. So I, I don't see him going anywhere. One thing, just a sort of note on the fight. There was one moment. And there's been a lot of cage grabs recently. There was, uh, especially in Bellator 138, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But there was one moment, I don't know if you remember this one, where Kawaji was on top, I want to say a half guard. And Dennis Siva li- literally reached out, grabbed the cage, and like pulled himself. Yeah. I, I don't know how far, but he, he, he like turned himself, him and Kawajiri on top of him, he turned them. And the referee, you know, yelled at him. But he's just getting to this point with, with fence grabs where it's like, how many how many warnings can you get? We'll talk about it a little bit in Bell Talk because it happened and it was hilarious when uh, Big John McCarthy actually slapped someone's hand off the cage to stop it. I think it was Dan Charles against Bobby Lashley, but you know it's a bit ridiculous with these fence grabs, don't you think? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with you, Cass. And because there is such a gray sort of area for referees, if I was in a situation like Dennis Siva where I knew I could grab the fence and do something like that, and it's my first defense for the fight, and I know I won't get my point deducted because it's the first time I'll do it. And it's the difference between, you know, being in a shitty position or getting out into a better position. I I might consider doing it because it is such a gray area. So I think, you know, later on when we do get more of these referees and umpires onto the program, it's definitely going to be a talking point because fighters know they can get away with it and um, nothing's stopping them from doing it. Let's talk about the main event. Ioanni Jacek against Jessica Penne. Jesus, that was absolutely brutal to watch. I like Jessica Penne and I like Joanna. And uh, just on a personal note, I actually think Jessica Penne, she's really, really attractive. Um, as Mo Sislak said in that episode of Simpsons, he ain't pretty no more. That was an absolutely brutal cut on Jessica Penne's nose. What did you think of the fight, Dennis? Yeah, you know, Penne, I was really surprised with her. She really brought more of a fight than I thought she would have. And she had a little bit of success with her throws, which I was impressed with. It was just the, the fact that her striking just isn't on the same level as Joanna. And Joanna is just such a great striker, such a great athlete. And so well-rounded now with her uh, defense and knowledge on the ground. It was, like you mentioned, really a blowout from that regard. But I was really impressed with the fact that Jessica was able to take that much punishment. I mean, when the fight was called off, she sort of looked at the referee and uh, almost like she was objecting it, like she wanted mm. it to keep going. So, mm. I mean, a lot of heart there, re- especially with that terrible cut over her nose, blood going everywhere. It was definitely one of those fights where p- people who aren't f- fans of women's MMA might start going, oh, I don't like seeing women bleed, blah, blah, blah. But I was really impressed with that heart. I thought she put on, you know, not the best performance in the sense of her striking. You know, the gap was really shown, but I thought some of her game plan sort of went the way she wanted it to. Too, but it was just Joanna. She, she's just so great. She threw out these great, great combinations. She mixes up the power and her strikes between light and strong, something that Nick Diaz does, which really sort of throws opponents off. And it was just a really great exhibition for her striking skills. I don't think she'll be going anywhere soon. She definitely looks like she's going to hold on to that title for quite some time. It was just a real pleasure to watch. I was actually impressed with Jessica Panay just because of that heart, like you mentioned before. And like you mentioned, when the referee stopped it, she didn't look like she wanted the fight to end. And I think a lot of other people, you know, they may have potentially mm. quit. So even though Jessica lost and she lost in brutal fashion, I think she, I still think her stock went up to a degree. I mean, she it's so early in her UFC career and she's already fighting for a title. So you can't take that away from her. Um, and you know what? I think she looked really good in the first round. I think her best sort of... Uh, 
her road to victory was basically to smother Joanna, don't let her get any shots off, don't let her get any uh, any range to basically throw those punches and those kicks and just smother her, take her down, see if she can take her down from the clinch and then try and work her ground game. And for a while, she was having success. And I think with you know a striker like Joanna, to really utilize the striking as best as you can, you really need to find your range and find your rhythm. And what Jessica did really well was she didn't let her establish her range and establish her rhythm. And it wasn't until the second, sort of third round that Joanna really started to tee off and really started to you know, find her range and get comfortable on the feet. So congratulations to Jessica on that. The The thing about Joanna and what's really, really impressive about it is her standing elbows from close range. Mm. So, you know, and this is something that we're seeing in MMA and it's almost like a, a, a rapid evolution over the last few years. I think really John Jones sort of started the trend of elbows and the guys at uh, Jackson Winkle John have really sort of delivered as well. You know, Carlos Condit, everyone's throwing elbows these days, but what Ioana has become really good at is throwing them in close range in the clinch. Um, and, you know, years ago, if you were, if you had a guy up against the cage or if you had, you know, your opponent up against the cage and there would be the break, you would throw possibly a hook or possibly a straight. And Ioana just basically does that with the elbows. So it really punishes any opponent that tries to come in and tries to smother her. Ioana's going to get her with uh, elbows to the face and, you know, knees to the body. And then, of course, she's got that Muay Thai plum that she can always punish her opponents with. So it was just absolute destruction from Ioana. And then afterwards, she jumped on the cage. Dennis, I know you'll appreciate this. It reminded me of Bill Goldberg in WCW when he said, who's <laughs> next and she was yelling out who's next really fiery she's got a really really interesting personality and i think she's almost uh i want to be careful what i say she's i don't want to say reaching the ronda rousey level because that's not true they're they're not even close but just in the sense that ronda rousey is obviously very dominant and becoming a force. Let's forget about Hollywood and her fame and all this kind of stuff. It's one of those things where even though Ronda Rousey's finishing people in the first round, regardless, she's not the kind of girl that you really want to face. And, you know, because she's been so destructive and so dominant, she can sort of get into the mind of her opponents. I think Ioana is a similar case. I mean, she not be she may not be finishing people in 16 seconds and, you know, 14 seconds, but the beating that she put on Jessica Penne, and essentially after the second round, Jessica Penne's... Uh, what's the word, game plan pretty much went out the window. Every time she even tried to clinch up, Joanna would push her away and, and brutalize her even more. So I think she's getting to that territory of a really, really feared champion that people you know, might be mentally beaten before they even get in the cage with. Yeah, absolutely. And also a likable champion. I don't think there's mm. anyone out there that dislikes her on the forums. And those places can get pretty catty sometimes with <laughs> thoughts about different people and stuff. And, you know, you spoke about the clinch work and you, you're absolutely right. The elbows from the clinch. And obviously, because she was a Muay Thai champion, um, something they utilize all the time. I'd like to see Jessica really go away from a grappless cl clinch to a Muay Thai clinch because she needs to understand that when she's grapp grappling and she's got that clinch, no one's going to be throwing uh, elbows at your, head, head, at your head. But what she needs to get used to is those elbows being thrown in her because a Muay Thai practitioner like Joanna, I mean, that's her bread and butter. And having that opening when the clinch is there, I mean, she really capitalized on it. So a lot of girls need to take notice of that. And now when I go into a clinch, I need to prepare to defend elbows and throw my own elbows because these Muay Thai practitioners, I mean, they've been doing it for decades now. So it's it's almost like giving cheese to, to, a, to a mouse. Yeah. If, if, you, if you can put it like that. A deadly mouse that can <laughs> slice your nose in half. That's it, yeah. And then, and then take your soul. Um, that's pretty much it for UFC Berlin. I know it was pretty quick, but honestly, Bellator 138 is the card that we're super excited to talk about. This was... I enjoyed every second of Bellator 138. Even you had, even though you had the UFC and Bellator on the same weekend, in a rare occurrence, Bellator, in my opinion, blew the UFC out of the waters. And it kind of wasn't, I guess it's not a fair comparison because here you had, even though you had a title fight on the UFC Berlin card, actually, sorry, you had a title fight as well in, uh, in, in Bellator, but... This is obviously a fight pass card. This is an international card. It was completely different. And this is Bellator's version of a pay-per-view. They don't really do pay-per-views, but if they did, this is exactly what they look like. My God, the stars were out on show. Before we even talk about any of the fights, what did you think of the whole production and the whole spectacle side of Bellator 138, Dennis? Well, I've got to say, Casper, you know, approaching this card, I didn't know what to think about it because of the main event. I thought, you know, this is going to be a disaster, one of those things where... You put two old sort of older guys in the main event and it's, the whole thing's going to come off sort of tacky and 
lame and sort of past the time that it should have been done. And then when I started watching it, I have to say Scott Coker just did an amazing job with the presentation of it. First of all, the arena looked great. I loved the entrances. I mean, the videos that were playing on the screens and people were coming out were crisp and cool. Um, the thing would come up and they'd come out, but it didn't look lame. And I was really, really impressed with all the production of it. I thought it had a real, it actually had a very big event feel. When I was watching it, even mm. though we're in Australia, we're nowhere near America, I felt I felt excited. I felt excited. It felt like anything could happen. And it was something different. A lot of people are used to watching UFC cards and UFC cards are great. But sometimes UFC cards, it's always the same thing. Like the announcers, they always announce in the same way. And you know, all right, an ad's going to come up now. A break's going to happen now. They're going to talk about this for about five minutes now. And it's great to watch an event where it's a little bit more unpredictable and you don't know what's going to happen. And it's done in such a great way. So I thought it was done very well. What did you think? Did you think the production quality was good in this one, Cass? Man, it was awesome. You, the, you had the huge stage. You had like a million Titan Trons. I mean, the, the UFC doesn't do at all. They've never done big... St well, actually, that's, sorry, not never. They did it back in the day and you had like Tito Ortiz with his fancy entrances. Um, but they've they've gone away from that. UFC, I guess they sort of go for more of a pure sp sports look. Um, they want to get away from that whole pro wrestling stage and Titan Trons. And Bellator pretty much going in the opposite direction. They're kind of like, we don't care. We want to make it look like a massive spectacle. And to their credit, they did fantastically. Not only not only did the stage look really good, but they had a lot of lights. There was like constantly lights flashing, different colors. It was very colorful. It was very brightly lit. The, uh, the mat looked really bright. It was much, much, much better than uh, the grey mat that they had back in the day with Bellator cards. Uh, what else? is very customized because they were in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, every time somebody came out, like you mentioned, the stage would lift up and the fighters would come out. It was a massive, massive spectacle. You know, you had different kind of people coming out with, uh, with different fighters. You had, you know... Road Warrior Animal coming out with Ken Shamrock and crazy things like that. So as far as a big event feel, they definitely, definitely delivered. Um, and it's not to say that the UFC doesn't in, in their right as well. Like I said, they're going for more the sports look. And like we, we couldn't say enough good things about UFC New Orleans a few weeks ago. And they didn't have the fancy lights or the stage or anything like that. So I think really, at the end of the day, the, the lights and everything like that definitely added and definitely helped but it was about the card at the end of the day and because they had good fights i think is is the main reason they delivered oh no absolutely i mean production values can, can only do so much so it was, it was an exciting night of fights a lot of great fights on the undercard a lot of familiar faces from the ufc that were fighting on the card but you know we want to kick it off talking about michael chandler versus Derek campos cast Michael Chandler, obviously synonymous with Bellator. If anything, one of the first stars that they built up in the brand. A guy that has been around the company for a while and fought the best of the best. Was on a winning uh, streak, but recently lost a couple of fights. What did you think of this fight? Well, I think Derek Campos, he was the perfect opponent for Michael Chandler. And this is Michael Chandler's basically chance to let people know whether whether he's still relevant in the division. I mean, he's really only lost to really good guys. He lost to Will Brooks. He lost the title. You know, that was twice in a row. And then prior to that, he lost to Eddie Alvarez. So, you know, it's not like he's losing to bums. It was a great win for against Eric Campos. He came out to coming home. Uh, the crowd absolutely loved it. We saw everybody on Twitter was saying that it was absolutely deafening in the arena. And then he came in. It was all all Michael Chandler from the very beginning. And then he put on a sweet rear naked choke. And it was one of those wins that definitely transcended the TV screen. You know, I'm, I'm not from St. Louis, Missouri, and you know what I mean? To me, it's just another fight, uh, regardless of how badly Michael Chandler was doing prior to that. But, you know, I, w I was genuinely really excited for the guy. It was an awesome moment, and, uh, you know, it was pretty heartfelt. It, and it's pretty exciting, considering that a moment like that can transcend to a another country here in Australia. Yeah, absolutely agree with you, Cass. A huge moment from him. And the thing is, this card, I'm not sure how many people are going to end up watching it. But for a lot of people, this will be the first Bellator card they would have ever seen. So being able to get a win like that on a card that's watched by so many people, you know, I, I think it's safe to say that Chandler's back and uh, people are excited to see him fight again. So if anything, he might. this might have been the first time a lot of people seen him fight. And it was a very impressive performance. So very interested to see what they do with him next. Now, moving on to the next fight, Daniel Strauss versus Henry Corrales. Uh, Cass Strauss, obviously, fought for the title last, wasn't able to do it, and uh, now found himself on one of the biggest cards of the year. What did you think of this card? Because, I mean, of this fight, because it was, it was a real barn burner. 
supreme performance, man, by Strauss. I was super, super impressed. He looked really, really good. And he looked like the type of guy that would possibly go straight back into the title shot. He completely dominated Corrales. Corrales didn't really have much for him at all. And then it all ended in the second round when uh, Strauss got the guillotine choke. Very, very slick. I think uh, Henry not really getting all that much offense in. There's, there's not really much to say about the fight. It was it was classic Strauss. And he, he looked like a guy who should be back in the title contention uh, pretty much straight away. Yeah, you know, and I agree with you. Not too much to say about the fight, apart from the fact that it was extremely exciting. I mean, after Pitbull's fight, we're going to talk about that fight very, very soon, actually pretty much next. Um, the commentator asked him if Strauss is someone that he wants to rematch again. I mean, I think top of everybody's mind as a potential contender in the division. He's just so very, very exciting. The man himself isn't somebody that's known around the world to every casual MMA fan. But, I mean, only 30 years old. He's from American Top Team, which is a great camp, and 23 wins and only six losses. I mean, this guy is a big star for Bellator and someone with an incredible skill set. So very interested to see what happens with him next. Cass, the next fight was a guest from previous week's episode, Bobby Lashley, a guy that has been in the WWE, actually worked with presidential uh, campaigner Donald Trump. Uh, they did the whole big angle with Vince McMahon. He's now in TNA Wrestling. He was supposed to fight James Thompson, but James pulled out with an injury, and he got Dan Charles in the last-minute replacement instead. He spoke to us on the show about how he wanted to fight James Thompson, whatever happens, but he, he's happy to go in there and just fight because he, want, he wanted to fight. Uh, what did you think of his performance, and what did you think of the fight? He got a lot of criticism over his style. Bobby Lashley, going in there, he, you know, the word on the street was that he wanted to show his improved striking, uh, his footwork, his timing. And against Dan Charles, he didn't really show any of that. He went for a takedown pretty much within, I don't know, the first 10, 20, 30 seconds. Took Dan Charles down, and the Dan, Dan the man couldn't get it done. Um <laughs> I actually didn't mind this fight. I actually thought it was exciting. Just because every time Bobby Lashley did take Dan down, it was with so much power. There was one point when Dan Charles had a triangle that he was going for, and Bobby Lashley picked him up and slammed him. I mean, as far as as far as far a guy that's primarily a wrestler, I think he's pretty exciting. I, I, I don't know. You, you guys let us know what you think in the comments below. Tell us if you enjoyed the fight. But even though it pretty much consisted of Bobby Lashley taking Dan down and ground pounding him, I still thought it was a decently exciting fight. Uh, one thing about Bobby Lashley, he carries so much muscle. I think he weighed in at 239 pounds, which for a guy looking that big, he's only like, he's only a mid-sized heavyweight. He's not one of the bigger heavyweights. I'd say around 250 plus is the big boys. And then anything, you know, 230 is, you're looking at a small heavyweight. And he's 239, so let's say two, 240. He's pretty mid-sized, but... I, don't know, I would love to see Bobby Lashley lose some of that muscle because he looks like the type of guy who's going to keep his strength regardless. And at the end of the first round, he sort of walked off really slowly, really gingerly back to his corner. And I thought, oh man, he might be tiring. And then he came out in the second round, guns blazing, uh, and he got the finish in the end. It wasn't really a, an exciting finish. It wasn't like, oh man, you know, knockout blows. Even though every time he throws, he, he really throws with bad intentions. It was just a case of, you know, Dan Charles just took so many punches, there wasn't really any point in, in letting the fight continue. But, you know, the one big criticism about Bobby Lashley has always been his cardio. And even though he looked great coming in the second round, I don't think the fight went long enough to really test that. So I'm still not 100% sold on that cardio of Bobby Lashley. Yeah, and, and yeah, the interesting thing is, I mean, a lot of people still look at Lashley as a big prospect in the heavyweight division, but what everybody's forgetting is he's 38 years old. Mm. I mean, he's 38 years old, which isn't young in MMA terms um, at all. In pro wrestling, 38 years old, bang, you, you might still have 10 years left in your career if you're a big name. In, in MMA, a lot of people are starting to look at people who are around 36, 37 as, all right, maybe time for him to leave. So I know he hasn't taken much punishment, but it's still impressive what he's, he's able to do. And I know a lot of people gave it a lot of flack, but when somebody can dominate with one style like Bobby Lashley can and show off those kinds of that kind of wrestling domination, I mean, that's exciting to me to see because, I mean, it's really up to the other guy to stop it. And I think that he looked very impressive, but it was, it was a smart game plan. When we spoke to him on the show last week and we spoke about Dan's knockout power and the fact that it could be an unpredictable fight because he is a heavyweight and anything can happen, we kind of got a sense from Bobby that he wasn't going to go out there and risk it all. 
I think he was a very strategic fight. He wants to get back in there as soon as possible. And I don't see why he won't be able to. It doesn't look like he took any damage in the fight at all. Um, Cass, the big uh, sort of point, the hot topic to talk about, Dan Charles grabbing the fence. He grabbed it a bunch of times. Uh, Big John McCarthy slapped his hand off the fence. What did you think about it all? Did you think a point needed to be deducted? Or did you think it sort of made sense to keep the fight going and not let Dan sort of catch his breath? Yeah, I think I really like John McCarthy. I really like him as a referee, but I think th- there needs to be a bigger point made of these fence grabs because I think even though it is a bit of a reaction, it doesn't matter. It's still a foul. You you need to punish it. You know, it like same with like uh, low blows. Like just because you you're hitting guys and it's an accident, I mean, it, it can't go unnoticed, and you can't just keep the fight going. I, I honestly think that it, even though it is a sort of like automatic reaction, I think guys might work on not grabbing the fence more if a bigger deal is made of it. So I think points need to start being taken away. And yeah, I mean, e- even though Bobby Lashley was dominating and it, it wouldn't have really affected him in, in any way, I still think the point should have been deducted. You because, know, uh, otherwise, what's the point? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, what's the point? Um, the interesting thing was when Bobby Lashley was on the program last week, he mentioned if he wins this fight, he's going to grab the mic and call out James Thompson. Uh, Bobby Lashley wins the fight. He gets the mic put under his mouth, and he doesn't call him out at all. Were you surprised at all, Cass? Because after that interview, I thought, hey, this is your time to call him out and make the fight happen, and it just didn't happen. Yeah, I think I think maybe Bobby realized that next week you got Czech Congo and Volkov fighting, um, and maybe he, I think he's eyeing the, I don't know, winner or loser. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's why. Maybe he's a little bit over James Thompson, and maybe he realizes that he's got to win on a on a huge card that everybody saw. And now it's time for a step up in competition. Like you mentioned, he's thirty eight. He's going for that title fight, and that's why it makes sense that he fought Dan Charles the way he did. Because if he loses now, if he gets caught, if he gets flashed and he gets knocked out, I mean, he's all the way back down to the bottom of the ladder. So mm. I think Bobby Lashley is in a sort of spot where he really, really can't afford to lose. If he wants that title shot, especially at his age, he can't afford to lose. And even though he's fought a lot recently, I mean, with MMA the way it is, you could get an injury and you could be silent for a year or two, and you know, you may never see that coming. It's interesting also, he's got an interesting story because obviously he's a pro wrestler at the same time as being an MMA fighter. Most of the time, this hasn't been a very successful combination. Now, we, there's a lot of great pro wrestlers that have gone into MMA and a lot of great MMA fighters that have gone into pro wrestling, but no one's sort of really did it, done it at the same time and been really, really successful. If he wins the title, he may be a guy that breaks sort of history being like a TNA champion and a Bellator heavyweight champion. So I'm very interested to see how it goes because personally, it's just crazy to me to see these guys balance both at the same time. Yeah, for sure. And before we talk about the next fight, Patricia Pitbull against Daniel Vichel, you know, the theme, I think, for this Bellator 138 card, because we t- keep talking about it of, you know, one of the biggest cards of the year, especially for Bellator. I think they did really smart in putting Kimbo and Ken Shamrock as the main event because that's going to draw, even though it has beyond zero relevancy in today's MMA world. But then they put all their young stars, the actual you know, the glue that holds Bellator together, like Patricia P- Pitbull, Daniel Weichel, you know, Bobby Lashley, a guy they're trying to push, Daniel Strauss and Michael Chandler, um, and they, they put them all on this card. So people are going to tune in for Ken Shamrock and Kimbo and then be treated to all these other guys and these other fun fights and these other personalities and go, hey, I want to tune in for, for another dose of Bellator MMA. The guys, the hardcore MMA fans that already watch Bellator, they're always going to tune in regardless and they're just going to absolutely love this this card. But for the casual fans who just happen to tune in on Spike that night, um, they're going to see these guys and go, damn, I want to watch more of this. So really, really smartly done by Bellator and Scott Coker. Yeah, nah. It's a, it was a supremely great idea, and I love the combination of the fights. I absolutely agree with you, Cass. Scott Coker on the ball with this one. Well, you mentioned the fight. Let's talk about it. Patricio Pitbull versus Daniel Wechel. And, I mean, he is a German fighter, and his nickname is The Weasel, believe it or not. 35 wins in his career. But I'll tell you what, in this fight, I was supremely impressed with him. I mean, he had Patricio hurt a number of times. And at the end of that first round, there was a bit of debate. There was a bit of debate because he did knock him down. John, Big John McCarthy stopped the stopped the round because it was the, at the end of the round, but a lot of people felt like, oh, did he stop the fight because uh, Daniel won, or did he stop the fight because it's the end of the round? Just wondering, Cass, watching the fight, did you have any questions whether or not the fight was, was finished, and did you have any qualms or problems with the way that it was done? No, I think it was fine. I think when I saw the, the bell sound, I was like, 
Oh my god, that is as close to save by the bell as it gets. I didn't think the fight got stopped. It looked to me like John McCarthy just ended it because it was the end of the round. But I think he did check on Patricio. He was looking at him very closely to see if he could continue. And I think that's one of the good things about John McCarthy. I think from Daniel Vichel's perspective, he didn't really understand. He, I don't think he heard the bell. And I think when Big John stepped in, he thought the fight was over. But to me, it, it just looked like the round had ended. Yeah, me too. I have no problems with it whatsoever. I know Daniel might because as a fighter, you don't even really understand the concept of time in that octagon. Everything's going so quickly with your adrenaline. Who knows what's going on? But uh, watching at home, it didn't look sus at all. Now, coming out into the second round, Patricia didn't get much of a... I mean, a lot of people watching on Twitter or on the internet or at home, they weren't going to give him much of a shot. It looked like... Uh, Daniel was going to capitalize and finish him off in the second round. And at the start, he started throwing flurries and punches at him. I thought, all right, we're going to have a new champion here. And then you get that crazy combination. Cass, I think it was a hook and a, and a straight that Patricia hit Daniel with, knocked him down and finished the fight out of nowhere as well, backing up against the cage. Did that make you as surprised as, as I got surprised when I was watching that? If I was drinking something, I would have spat it out all over the TV. To me, it was insane, especially because at the start of the round, he looked like he was still hurt. He wasn't engaging, and I thought, dude, this guy is, he's like, he's almost out of there. And then for him to finish uh, Daniel, you know, only 30 seconds in, or whatever, technically 32, but, you know, right, right at the start after looking like he was still hurt, that was insane. Honestly, one of the best comebacks uh, I don't want to say I've ever seen, but it was an awesome, awesome comeback. Twice in a row now for, for Patricio Pitbull. And I really like him. I really like Pitbull. I think he's got a great personality in the sense that he's in there to fight. He's a very, very skilled fighter, a lot of heart. I really think that he made a lot of fans um, from the event. Obviously, a lot, a lot of people watching it on Spike TV. I think his profile has risen a lot from that fight. Yeah, but I think one of the reasons why I like him also is the fact that he speaks English. I think that's a big deal. I think that's a lot of times why mm. I find a little bit disconnected when I'm watching the Brazilian cards because I don't obviously I don't know what they're saying when they're speaking Portuguese, uh, but the the translators usually do a horrendous job and it just takes so long and it's bloody agonizing hearing, you know, they go back and forth, back and forth. So, you know, I think Patricio Pitbull, as far as one of the Brazilians, um, you know, he's he's a marketable guy. He's he's got a good personality and I like that. Yeah, very exciting. Now, I mean, leading into the main event, everybody really enjoyed the card underneath. I mean, so many exciting fights, fights that we didn't even speak about with guys with familiar faces, guys like Justin Lawrence getting a quick uh, TKA win and all, all, all the other fights that we didn't have, really have a time to talk Adam about. Adam Seller as well, the guy that got knocked out brutally by Uriah Hall. Wow. So it's just, yeah, a lot of stuff happening on the card. I think going into the main event, Cass, I don't know. The expectations weren't high. I mean, a lot of people, we spoke to a bunch of people, a bunch of MMA fans, a bunch of people on the internet, just people in general. And a lot of people sort of had the feeling of, I hope this isn't going to be embarrassing. I hope this isn't going to be a fight where it's sort of two guys that are way, way past it and it takes away from the whole event. But I think you got so much great action from the event already that yeah. no matter what happened in the main event, it wasn't going to ruin your night. And then I, f I fully agree. If this is one of those cards where it was just, in a, in a lot of ways, it was built around Kev, uh, Kimbo versus Ken Shamrock. And I think that was kind of like the bait to lure you in. And then you get all this uh, other awesome action. But I think it was one of those ones where, okay, we've got an awesome main event. People are going to tune in. We're going to give a crap on the card. It would have been one of the worst events in history. And as far as the fight itself, Kimbo versus Ken... <laughs> it, it, yeah. what, what do you even say like it's not it, it was never going to be uh it was never going to be relevant it was never going to be ufc caliber it wasn't even really going to be bellator caliber it was just pretty much there for fun and for ratings and that's pretty much what we got talking about the fight itself you know and people were asking us on youtube and on twitter and things like that um you know what do you think how's this fight going to go and it was almost impossible to call because these guys had been away from the sport for so long, both of them, Ken and Kimbo. Finally enough, Kimbo has been more active than Ken. Ken's last few fights have been absolutely horrible to watch. I don't think I think the last time he fought was like what, 2010? Um 
and he had you know he had some fights in Australia and it was just it was absolutely brutal and then you know Ken Shamrock was convincing everybody that he he was feeling the best he's he's ever felt and things like that and then you had Kimbo who was never really he was never a great MMA fighter and he went over to boxing as well and people were suspicious of his opponents and then he was coming to MMA so it was just a lot of factors I mean you talk about style you know styles and at the end of a lot of breakdowns you have the X factors this pretty much this matchup was pretty much all X factors um and I just want to take a second to highlight what we all witness. You know, there's been a lot of errors in MMA. Uh, you've got, obviously, the the original, you know, Hoist Gracie days and, of course, Ken Shamrock days. You've had, uh, you know, you've had Pride. That was an error. You know, Matt Hughes, that was an error. GSP, that was an error. Uh, you know, Chuck Liddell, that was an error. Brock Lesnar, these are all errors. And in many ways, they were separate errors. But the, the, all, the thing that all those errors have in common is they're all over. They all came and all went. Now, the interesting thing is Ken Shamrock fought at the very, very first UFC, right? He was there before all those errors, and then in 2015, we still saw him fight. I just want to let that sink in for a second, because for me, that's that's insane. That's that's how long this guy's career has stretched out. Yeah, no, it's a absolutely crazy fact that you brought up, and I mean, it's just sinking in on me. The guy, the guy is, look. You know, the fight was what it was, but you can't help but have respect for him for, for going in there and doing it. I mean, I think there was a little bit of a miscommunication between Bellator and Ken Shamrock, though. Now, at the weigh-ins, he was uh, 204.4 pounds, I believe, while Kimbo almost had 30 pounds on him. It went from a heavyweight fight cast to a catchweight bout. Yeah. Um, A lot of a lot of sort of uh, question marks popped up in the MMA community. I mean, I, I guess uh, Ken Shamrock just wanted to come in in the best shape he could possibly but I don't think it was a detractor from the fight, but just a little bit funny to see how that kind of played out. Well, it added to the freak show aspect, as if it wasn't already a freak show fight. Now you've got one guy who's a light heavyweight, now you've got one guy who's a heavyweight. And not only that, I mean, while we're talking about weights, Kimber looked absolutely horribly uh. out of shape. I think that was one of Kimbo's biggest selling points. If he didn't look the way he did, uh, because even when he fought all those guys on the streets, I mean, one thing you notice about Kimbo, some of his opponents as well, was that he was in fantastic shape. He had a great physique. He had a great look. Uh, even when he was on the Ultimate Fighter 10, I mean, he had probably one of the most, it's not a bodybuilding contest, but he had probably one of the most aesthetic physiques. So, you know, he just, he had a look. He had that. He had the bald head, he had the beard, and he had a, he had a killer physique. So even if he wasn't, the most threatening guy, you could sort of sell him as being one of the most threatening guys because he kind of looked like it. And here he came in, you know, the Wayans, he didn't want to take his uh, tank top off. He looked in horrible shape. So even w- once they were walking into the cage, and Ken Shamrock, oh, no, 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 sorry, Kimbo, when he was walking, he looked like he had a limp the whole yeah. time. When he was walking to the arena, when he was walking in the cage, I was watching those knees thinking, like, can he can he bend his knees? Because if you remember back in the day, even in Ultimate Fighter, he had a problem with, with the wheels. Then The knees were injured, and I think he had to have surgery. And, uh, you know, he got destroyed by Mitriona, had the horrible fight against Houston and Alexander. So, you know, it just goes to show how long it's been. And uh, I don't know, man. This, what did you, what did you think of the actual fight itself? Because that was another freak show in and itself. Yeah, I mean, Kimbo Slice. Um, how old is he, Cass? Forty one years old, I believe, somewhere around there. Yeah, something like that. I know Ken Shamrock's fifty one, and uh, Kimbo had like ten yeah, years. 41, so yeah, 41, 41, Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. So he's forty one years old, and I mean, I noticed it as well. He's moving around very, very gingerly. I mean, Ken Shamrock's moving around very gingerly because he's had a lifetime of fights. And I mean, so has Kimbo Slice on the streets, but he looked he, he doesn't look like his body's in very good shape. And in the fight, when Ken Shamrock went for those takedowns, and I mean, I mean, again, no disrespect to Ken Shamrock. He's one of the greatest of all time. But those takedowns, man, they were so slow, so horrible. And the fact mm. that he was able to get Kimbo Slice down... I was like, wow, because Kimbo Sly spoke in a lot of interviews leading into this one. I listened to one that he did with good old JR, who does a nice uh, the podcast there and podcast one where he said, oh, I dare uh, Ken Shamrock to try and take me down. I dare him. I want him to see what happens. And yeah, Ken Shamrock went there and uh, Kimbo Slice fell and it almost looked like he, he just couldn't keep balance. It wasn't that he couldn't defend the takedown, just that he couldn't t- keep balance. And then what happened was Ken Shamrock had him in a perfect position, re-naked choke. And I thought, I mean, I was watching this fight with some, with a couple of people. I said, all right, it's all over. There's no way Kimbo's going to get out of this. I mean, he's not known for his submissions. And then he did the basic wide belt escape where he put his uh, shoulder on the mat. 
Ken lost positioning and he, he was able to get up. It was it was crazy. If anything, I think it might be one of his proudest moments in MMA being able to get out of a submission when it's so so close to being over. And then those two punches, he cut Ken's head open and that was sort of the end of it. But I guess it played out a lot better than it could have. I mean, look, if Ken Shamrock went in there and he finished him with that choke, we'd be talking about, all right, Ken Shamrock's sort of back for a couple more fights. Um, but it's funny how it played out because it was sort of back and forth in a lot of ways and people got the most out of the contest, I guess, that they could have. Somewhere out there, Fabrizio Verdum is shitting himself knowing that Kimbo Slice, <laughs> Abu Dhabi Kimbo Slice, is, is back. Um, to me, it played out like a wrestling event or like a wrestling match. It was it, Not only was there such a build-up prior to it, but even during the fight, it was like, I'm not saying it was a work, but... Yeah, you had Ken Shamrock. He didn't. He didn't want any of Kimbo Slice's striking. Any, any at all. He had his head to him. He was trying to avoid. It almost looked like he wanted to to have a fight without a single punch. And then, yeah, you're right. That takedown. I didn't think he was going to get it at all. When Kimbo fell, I was like, wow, really? Wow. I, I didn't realize what happened until I watched the replay. And then Ken Shamrock looked like he had a rear naked choke. Looked like he had it in perfectly. I can't believe that he lost yeah. position. It's Out not of like all Ken the people Sh- in the world, Ken Shamrock. Right? Doesn't yeah, finish a submission from there, and he he had it. It was under the chin and everything, and yeah, Kimbo Slice like he put his hands on the on the on the ground. There was like at least two times, maybe three times, where I thought Kimbo had tapped, and then there was another time where I thought Kimbo was passed out. I thought it was like one hundred percent over, and I was like, oh my god, wow! After all that talk, after all that, and then yeah, when Kimbo got up, I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it, and then it was just a face crushing punch to the face. And Ken Shamrock just, yeah, he fell down. And, and that was pretty much, th- the way he fell, it was, it was almost like you could watch a movie. And him falling kind of represented his career. Like, that's it. Once once he hit the ground, I honestly don't, with all due respect to Ken Shamrock and everything that he's accomplished, I don't think he should step in the cage at all. Because to be honest, he didn't, he didn't, um, how do I phrase it? I don't want to say he didn't look like an MMA fighter, but in a way he didn't. Like, he didn't want to strike at all. You know what I mean? And if, if you're coming into a fight and you just you don't even want to do one of the fundamental aspects and you just want to sort of grapple and you just want to, I don't know, it, it almost looked like he was scared to strike with, with Kimbo, honestly. And when he was on our show, he said that Kimbo's not a good striker. He said he doesn't know where that notion came from. He's not a good striker at all. And then when the fight came, he, he didn't want any of uh, Kimbo's punches and then he got brutally knocked out. It's just, yeah, I don't know. I, don't know. I, I guess respect to both guys at the end of the day because they, they stepped into the cage. And I'm I'm wondering what Ken's reasons were because he said he was feeling healthy and I guess the the obvious thing to look at and I'm not saying it's true but a lot of people may look at it and think well Ken needs the money I don't know I don't know but he he certainly didn't look great he didn't move great he didn't look great fighting um you know he says he's the best in, in the best shape of his career it, it, it's definitely not something that I think any of the viewers saw but in saying that. It was fun, I, I, and I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the entire event. Yeah, it was a fun. It was a fun thing. It was set up nicely, and I got to agree with you, Cass, uh, Ken Shamrock. I mean, all respect to him. He's he's an absolute warrior, but he looked really, really old. Um, really looked his age, and doesn't look like he should get back in there. And I just want to go back into his record and go back to let's say 2002 when he first fought uh, Tito Ortiz. He was too old then, and that was mm. in 2002. Then he went on. He, he got one win, but then he went on to lose to uh, Rich Franklin via TKO, Sakuraba via TKO, Tito Ortiz via TKO, Tito Ortiz again via TKO, Robert Berry via KO. He got a couple of wins, and then he lost another couple of times by KO. I mean, he would have taken a bit of damage, you know, in his career. And, I mean, 10 years ago, seemed like he was a bit too old. So I agree with you. I just don't want to see him step back in there and sort of get beaten up because – from from a fan's perspective, he just doesn't look like he's got what it takes to be in an octagon anymore. And I mean, I guess that goes now to his bare knuckle boxing event that he spoke to us about so passionately, the one that he wants to bring to pay-per-view. I mean, I'm still curious to see if he's going to go through and be on that card because I'm not sure if I want to see him on there. I mean, maybe he can put a card together and be like a spokesperson or the president or a commentator or a big part, not a big part of it, but... Not just not sure how much more damage he should be taking as all. Well. Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm not even 100% sure that that's actually going to come together. 
because it, it seems like it's still up in the air. Remember when Ken Shamrock is going to fight James Tony? I think it's a different story when, say, the UFC says we're doing an event and Bellator says we're going to do an event mm. as opposed to, you know, a bare-knuckle boxing thing. And they say that, you know, it's not regulated, but Ken Shamrock, when he was on the show, said a lot of things that, that were very interesting about how it's, it, it's not regulated, but it's not illegal, and they're going to do it in an arena, and there's going to be, I think, other MMA fights as well. Or, or I think it's going to be, like, you know, a full card of bare-knuckle boxing and things like that. So I don't know, man. I, I don't know if that'll actually happen but i guess you got to think a guy his age who just got knocked out um and he wants to do bare knuckle boxing i don't know if that's the healthiest for his body but i mean look at the end of the day that's his choice i just don't know how well he's gonna fit uh you know how, how well he's gonna fare in that in terms of the matchup man it, it's interesting because kimbo's won and he says he's, he wants to have another fight i honestly think these guys were the perfect matchups for each other you could not find a better matchup oh, yeah. for ken shamrock or for kimbo like you put uh, Kimbo against any other heavyweight in on the Bellator roster, in my opinion, he will lose, and I, in my opinion, he will lose badly. So I don't know what the, what you're gonna do next with Kimbo. He's probably good for one more fight because I think his next fight he will probably lose pretty badly. South Petrozelli, he stormed the cage. He wants that fight. Apparently, Kimbo's not too interested. Yeah, and he's he, willing to go in there. He was interested before when he first signed to Bellator. He said it's some unfinished business for him that he'd like to take care of. But then something mm. changed. And I have a big feeling that it's Kimba realizing, hey, my body is just not where it needs to be to fight a guy like Seth Petrozelli, who, think- who's retired from MMA, mind you, but is a guy who's obviously athletic, a great athlete, and someone who could probably really destroy Kimba. And way younger as well. That's the other thing. And I think it's one of those things like when, when you feel your body going like that, you, you're going to feel it in the fight. If anything, you're going to feel it in the fight. You may feel it a little bit in training, but then the fight is really going to bring that out on you. Yeah, that's it. So interesting to see what happens with Kimbo next. Cass, before we wrap up quickly, just your thoughts. Uh, Bellator is going to have a card with Glory. They're going to have some kickboxing fights, some MMA fights. Just quickly, my thoughts. I think it's a genius idea. I think Scott Coker's on the ball. He's already set up that awesome light heavyweight tournament uh, featuring Kingmo and Phil Davis, Newton, and obviously set up the Tito Ortiz title fight. I mean, I think old guns are firing at the Bellator Center. I think they're doing the right things. Yeah, don't forget Linton Vassell. Yeah, and you've got, yeah, like, I don't know if you said, Tito Ortiz versus uh, McGeary for the title. That's awesome. Everybody wins. And you've got Glory there as well. I'm really curious how they're going to do it. You know, they're going to have uh, they're going to have a ring and they're going to have a cage as well somewhere in the arena. So that's a sort of to be seen uh, you know, that, mm. that's that, that's something that I'm going to be interested in. And obviously the show is called Dynamite, you know, a throwback to the old Dynamites back in the day uh, between Pride and K1. Um, and those were super, super, super successful. So that's awesome, man. Good on Scott Coker. It's like it's like he's bringing back all the things that people love, you know, like he's bringing Fedor to the signings. He's, uh, you know, bringing back this whole Dynamite thing. I love it, man. And, it's dude, it's going to be a tournament. These guys are going to fight twice in one night. So and and the winner I guess will challenge uh, the winner of Tito Ortiz and Liam McGeary. So I'm super excited. That's that's a that's a really really exciting card. And even though there's a, there's some awesome 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 UFC cards, this one definitely stands out to me. Yeah, stands out. And I mean the title fight between Tito and Liam, Liam McGeary, obviously such a talented grappler and a fighter and an MMA fighter. I mean it's not one of those fights where Tito's fighting Stefan and people are wondering, well, will these guys be able to deliver? I mean. Mm. Questions will be answered. Can Tito still compete with a guy who's a very, very good fighter in Liam McGeary? Or can Liam McGeary beat Tito Ortiz? I mean, it's going to be one of those fights. It's going to be very, very interesting for the fans to watch. Definitely a big test for Tito Ortiz. And it's a win-win situation. Let's say, let's say you know, you have Tito win, and then you've got Tito versus King Mo. That's going to be a fun fight. Or you've got Tito versus Phil Davis. So I think it's a win-win situation. Um Honestly, man, I think that that's enough of us for another week. I just want to say a big thank you to our guests, obviously, Stipe Mircic, Ben Rothwell, and the always entertaining Al I Quinta. Thank you so much for you guys for listening to the uh, to the show. We always appreciate it. Thank you. I just want to give a big shout-out to everyone who's been giving us awesome ratings on uh, iTunes and uh, Stitcher and all that. That definitely doesn't go unnoticed. We've seen a big influx since we've been sort of mentioning it on the show. So big thank you to you guys. If you are listening on Stitcher or iTunes or TuneIn or anything like that, feel free to give us a rating. You know, I'm not saying you have to give us five stars. Give us whatever you think we deserve. But if you do give us five stars, it definitely helps the show because iTunes goes, huh, People like this show. I guess we're going to you know, promote it more and things like that. Um, let us know your thoughts. If you're on YouTube, definitely subscribe. Leave us your comments. What did you think about this crazy 
Kimbo versus Ken Shamrock fight. You know, did you enjoy it? Did you enjoy the the circus that it was, or, or were you expecting something more? And uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at submission a u s. Dennis, before we uh, we pull the plug, any final words for the listeners? Yeah, you know, obviously we had Ben Rothwell on the program, Stepe Miocic on the program. Let us know what you think. Who do you want to fight for the title next? And if Stepe and Ben aren't fighting for the title next, who do you want to see them fight next? Let us know in the comment section below. We'd love to hear your thoughts. We'll catch you guys next week.